And we're off. Cool. The Virgin Maiden. That's not the right. The vo- the Maiden Voyage <laughs> or something <laughs> you, has begun. Yeah. Well, anything's acceptable, right? R- right. I think. Is it? Uh, are maybe. we still free? I don't know. I, you know, that's a good question. Were we ever free? That would be the debate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question to examine, you know. Let's Maybe, just dive uh, right in. Who's, screw introductions. Let's just get right into deep politics. <laughs> deep pol. Yeah, yeah. Because we are we are well versed in yep. everything. Yeah. Well, g- man, it's uh finally finally we've uh we got this thing kicked off after trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah, and it's surprisingly, I feel like, you know, this is something that I had talked about a few times. I mean, you and I, I'm, I'm sure, discussed it at some point. I've talked about it with a diff- few different people. I mean, it's been even probably almost as long as 10 years ago, I think, discussing the idea of a podcast at some point and never just took the initiative, you know, some initial research maybe here and there. But, like, I think everything in general nowadays is just a lot easier. And, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, and you get on this side and you have a microphone and go, you know? So, yeah. For the most part, it's not too complex. I mean, granted, you've done more of the back end stuff, so. But we are at least set up with our uh, um, audio podcast for now. Maybe we'll bring the video into the fold later, and um, and then we'll be. So tell tell everybody, Victor Victor Ramos here. I'm Skunk Manhattan. Um, for those that don't know, the name of the podcast is Eclectic Soundtracks Podcast, and. Uh, we're going to be talking about music and soundtracks, the way music impacts uh, everyone's life. I think most people, you know, are influenced by music or everybody, you know, I would say on some level or another, you know, even if it's just subconscious, like, uh, so that into, and then that'll integrate into people's lives. Obviously we'll be interviewing a lot of musicians, but also all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds. And, and, uh, and then we'll just let the conversations go where they will. But, um, so yeah, we've got our basic social media set up. So anyone that wants to follow us can find us for now on Facebook at Electric Sound Soundtrack, Eclectic Soundtracks, and um, an Instagram, right? And yeah. and then a YouTube page, which we'll put. I guess this will end up being on. We'll we'll post this stuff on all those sites when yeah. it's um, done. And also, right. Victor, where does this end up going? So it'll be on like Apple Music. Will it be on? Spotify? Spotify. I'm not. I'm not as familiar with podcasts and in, in yes. terms of where they show up. Yeah. So we'll we'll be on uh, pretty much just every anywhere you can get podcasts. So uh, Apple, uh, Spotify, Overcast, whatever else is out there. So cool. Yeah, and it took us a while to figure out a name, and I don't. I mean, we still can't pronounce a damn thing. So. Yeah, and here, I, <laughs> right off the bat, I'm saying it long. Okay, everybody, it's. I can't even say. Erectric? <laughs> I'm, I'm Elmer Fudd all of a sudden. Uh, electric? <laughs> e- e- eclectic. eclectic. Every time I spell that, I'm like the worst at spelling. Every time I have to sound words out, I, I think I get mad more times in a day from my inability to spell things correctly. I mean, granted, we have spell check and all that kind of stuff nowadays, but the worst is when you're like trying to write a word in a document and, and your misspellings not even close enough to like for it to figure it out. And it's just like, I have to like Google shit all the time to be like, God, how do you spell this damn word? And I, like, every time we were doing eclectic setting the social media, I'm like, ecle- eclectic. Yeah. I, the other night when we were setting up everything, I, it, I, for whatever reason, I could not spell the damn thing. Right. And I, I would get bounce backs and who knows what. And I try to pull up a page with the name and I was like, damn it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I guess we, we kind of lean toward that because. You know, obviously, you know, everybody's different, has different musical tastes. And, um, you know, I've, I've always found it easy to uh, build rapport, connect with somebody over music, even, you know, even going as far back, you know, uh, outside of high school when I was in the military, you know, just meeting people from all parts of the 
country, you know, just uh, making friends just through, Hey, that's, Hey, that's a cool, you know, I like that band too. That's a cool song, you know, whatnot. So <clears throat> and it, that's helped me branch out to different, uh, different genres, different, uh, uh, types of music. And, uh, just really, I mean, I, I think that's just the goal, right? It's just finding common ground, being able to connect with somebody through something as simple as music, or maybe you have, you know, a moment in your life where, Hey, uh, you know, one of my first duty stations, like in, in the Washington state area, uh, anthrax's sound of white noise came out. Right. So that has, you know, that brings back memories every time I listen to that album. So. Yeah, I mean it's exactly man. That's the one. I think it's a uni- it's a, um, a global unifier, man. You know, it's the one thing that the, it's the one language everyone can understand, and you can relate to things even if you don't understand the words or know what they're saying, or if there are no words. And there's different, you know, different people have different tastes and this and that. But I think as a general rule, I'd say, especially as a musician, me being a musician, like the the older I get and the more you know, I think for most people, I would think the older you get in general, you sort of become a little more aware and, and, um, interested in, in variety and different things, you know? So when you're young, you might really latch on. And I think a lot of us in our, in our teenage years and all that high school kind of stuff, I think we all always hold those sort of moments dear. And those are tend to be our favorite lifelong bands and all that kind of stuff, but there's so much more and you discover, you know, so I'm into like, all kinds of music across the board. And and it's for me being a musician and being in different bands and relating to all these people, like tons of my friends are musicians. I've met so many like great people through music, at, you know, either playing music with them or from people at different shows, you know, it's, I mean, just probably thousands of people, you know, like that have, that is the, the sort of catalyst bond, you know, it, it starts with the music and then you get to know them as a person and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it's really cool. And I think that was our idea behind the eclectic soundtracks is sort of, there's a wide, we're, we're all very different, you know, um, people are meant to be um, individuals in, you know, but we have the common human elements that, that despite like things that we may disagree on or, or how different our backgrounds may be, we can find common ground almost always, you know, and music is one of, I think the, the biggest, uh, ways that, that, that is, um, achieved, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as far as backgrounds, I mean, I've, you know, we, what are, what are we in like 15 years now that we've known each other? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that was, uh, I think the very first time we hung out, that was what we did. We went, so we met in a Spanish class. It was <laughs> not, right. not too long after I had moved, moved to Austin. And I don't know if you were, I guess you were, you were kind of in the tech world at that point, but how long yeah. had you been out of the military for a while, I guess? Uh, were, I was probably, yeah, I was probably out of the military, uh, maybe five years and you were five, Marines, five right? going on six. Yeah. Yeah. Marines. And, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> we, we met in Spanish class and, uh, we had, a we had an assignment to where w- right. we had to come up with a skit. That's right. That's right. Dude, we, and skit. we just, ha- and we happened to be, we just, we just got really lucky in terms of, cause I think we were grouped basically just based on who was around us. Yeah, randomly. And so it was yeah. like you and I, and then two girls, uh, right? And I'm or was yeah. it another guy and a, and a girl? Might have been another guy. I think it was another, another. another yeah, another guy, another girl. Uh, the guy was a was a dude that worked with me. Uh, That's right. I can't remember yeah. his name. I'm pretty sure the girl's Jason. name was, was was Jason and Stacy, right? Stacy, and yeah. she was uh, in the military uh, she, as well. Yeah, yeah, she was uh, she was army. Yeah, and but anyway, like it was such a perfect dynamic in that group because. She was, I mean, she paid attention when we didn't. <laughs> and so I think she was really good with, uh, the, with the, you know, like she, she was just really smart, really savvy and really took the bull by the horns and kind of like uh, d- put a lot together. And then you and I like really bought, a, I think, a, kind of a fun creativeness to what we did. And I remember now it was like a newscast thing, right? We've yeah. actually, we've got a DVD of that somewhere, man. Do you still somewhere. have that? I feel <laughs> yeah, like I, mean, I have that thing and I came across it at one point and I was like, Oh my God, like I f- should find that damn thing and put it out there, man. That would be hilarious. I remember put it on our page. so much. Yeah. I remember kicking so much ass. Oh, we just crushed every on that other project. Group. Yeah. We and crushed we were, and we were, <laughs> And we got like a B. <laughs> Did we? What? Yeah. Well, well I, don't I don't know, man. Our teacher, what was his name? Todd. He was a, Todd, yeah, he was a cool guy. He spoke like four hundred languages, he, and he was, he was not 
fucking around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he started class by just right off the bat speaking Spanish. Hola, mi amo, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, <laughs> for whatever reason, he, he just, uh, I remember there was a joke one time about the, uh, it's been an inside joke of ours for years about Baracho, about me. Was that had to pertain to one of us about somebody being drunk or something, and that just became yeah. a, a joke. I don't know. I don't remember even the context anymore. But because I, I think he called on you for something, and you mentioned bor- borracho, right? And he was like, "Oh my god, you remembered something or, or I, something along those lines." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, we that project we did, we had it was like a newscast, and we had to do so. There was like the head anchors, which was probably Stacy and Jason. Or I yeah. remember I came on for like as a reggae dude for a weather segment or something, or I was interviewed for something. We had to do a weather thing. We had to do like a current event, and and then but then remember I was doing the music, and I forgot yeah. I had brought my guitar, and I was like sitting off to the side playing like little 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 diddly little commercial stuff. ditties, yeah, yeah, little commercials and all. So it was a pretty fun fun that was a fun deal and then after that like after the class was because i don't think we ever really hung out aside from that but then i think the last day of class or something you and i went to the back room and maybe jason too yeah and had a I think beer. we all did yeah we yeah. might have all just done the, and, I, and it's um we yeah and it's funny beer. now yeah man the the freaking back room if that tells you anything and then uh, you know who knew like a, a year later you know um i, I played one of the the first the first of two quote last shows that the back room did <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you were, I mean, you just got a gig with, uh, with, uh, one of the first bands that you played with here, right? Yeah. That was actually when I first moved here, I started a band, uh, I was doing a working a vending business with my uncle at the time. And, uh, and then my brother moved here and he was, so we were both working there and we would actually rehearse in the warehouse space. And, uh, we had a, a an originally a sort of a, a really, bad cover band called pitchfork <laughs> but we had a blast and somehow we got gigs playing we played a few like biker rallies and some things like that but uh when that was kind of when that fizzled uh, i got um on with this band quarter shackle who people who have been around austin for a long time some people may remember that name from you know 15 years ago or whatever but or 10 you know i guess it was around yeah 2005 to 2009 or something like that and um in terms of active live playing and so Right about that time uh, that we met, I think I had joined that band or, or shortly thereafter started playing right. with them. And that was like me getting my feet wet in the Austin music scene back then. And then you got the teaching gig too, right? Somewhere around. Yeah, actually. Yeah, they, that's right. That, it all kind of came from the same place because it just so happened when I went to uh, meet or audition uh, for that band, another guy that was at the studio um, uh, was... Um, had a, oh, had a yeah. buddy who was uh had a was opening a music school and it hadn't opened yet or anything like that and i had done some like private teaching a little bit but man it's just like anything else you have to kind of learn how to do it you know and, and uh i mean it's one thing to be a a player and be great in your bedroom it's a whole nother thing to perform it's a whole nother thing to record and also teach so i'm obviously much better and more confident as a teacher nowadays than i than i was back then <laughs> but but i but you know he was it was a brand new thing he needed people and i uh so i went and interviewed and got the job and i was like the first dude like one of the first five people that ever worked there and ended up bringing in uh several other instructors and was you know the only piano teacher that's, over there and, and all right. that but yeah i forgot yeah, about that and I, you... and it's, it, I met several you know people uh, through that, that, that were students, you know, fi- that are just have become, you know, been great friends now for nearly 15 years. Got in some guys that were, you know, in their thirties or forties then, and some that were kids, you know, that might, might've been a teenager that are in their mid twenties or 30, that are the age I was back then, you know? So it's, it's pretty interesting, man. Yeah. Yeah. That was a pretty cool time. I mean, I remember, yeah, you mentioned the recording through uh, what was that at Mesa, right? Yeah, and that was back. So yeah, Rob Hinton was the the studio. That's there. right. And that was before he had uh, Mesa Recording Studios that he oh, has that, now yeah. out in the valley. This was an old place off uh, South Lamar that he well, had. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, and so and and there he was still. He was also working with uh, the guys from Lost Rain, and then Keenan became one of the guitar teachers out there. That's right. right. Yeah, Keenan, my brother came in, caught there. Uh, John Simpson. That's who right. I met from, oh, yeah. from Maven. Witch. That's how I met him way back 15 yeah. years ago. Well, not quite, maybe 2007. We played a rock fest, uh, 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 kind of coinciding thing during South by Southwest with with Maven and some other, ba- you know, Powder Burn, oh, all yeah. those kind of bands from yep. from back in the day. And um, yeah, so uh, 
yeah, man. And just became friends with all those guys. And it, it was a really cool, a really cool time actually. Cause there was a lot of really great bands out there. Yeah. And I remember really that. Just, uh, a really nice, cool, humble down to earth people, man. So it was, it was, uh, it was, I had a lot of fun uh, around that time playing, playing shows there for a while. Yeah. We, we really found out we liked a lot of the same music. I mean, I think when we we're filming that, those skits, uh, we were talking about Alice in Chains. I do remember that. Mm-hmm. It might have been the, uh, 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 which album, the acoustic album, right? Star Flies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. You know, I don't, remember specifically what we talked about but i do remember specifically when well i think we probably all met at back room and then they took yeah. off and you and i hung out a little while longer and got major baracho <laughs> that's and then, right and then and then we just <laughs> talked music for quite a while i think it was one of those times back in the day where and it's like oh check this out sitting in the car listening to a cd kind of thing i also remember when i first moved here man um the the literally the day I moved here, Clutch had, was on tour on, on touring on Blast Tyrant, oh, and so I saw Clutch album. at um, I think it was at Emos, and it was really cool because I had a bunch of friends come down from like San Antonio, like I had all these different friends, but maybe like you know somewhere between five and ten people, and and they all everyone just like crashed at our new place, and we all went to this concert and everything. But I bet we we talked about Clutch. I know Clutch is yeah. one of the bands that you and I have both been fans of ever since you know I first heard them in two thousand four. You know, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I I saw them on their first tour in what was it ninety three ninety four. Wow, man, that's up in that's... up in Washington. Um, and, oh yeah, because they were East Coast. That was they was probably just getting their feet wet on their own turf up there, huh? Yeah, yeah, they, it was a, oh, you're talking was a Washington pretty, or Washington, D.C.? No, Washington State. Oh, um, you're talking, oh, well, okay, West yeah, Coast. Yeah, yeah, I was, I, I was stationed out there and a buddy of mine introduced me to Clutch and it was, it was through the song, A Samurai Named Marcus. Yeah. And, uh, and he, and so he, you know, he played it. He was a metalhead, fellow metalhead out of Iowa. Uh, he ended up, you know, uh, working with, uh, the Slipknot guys, if I, remember correctly but uh he he introduced me to a whole just another big bunch of bands um uh, but yeah he he played uh that clutch single and then he mentioned hey clutch is playing with sepultura and uh fear factory i think was who else was on but clutch was the opening band and they took up like a really small corner of the stage mm-hmm. little little four piece and they kick so much ass. <laughs> yeah, they're one of those bands that uh, they have the hu- a huge cult following, and like, and they put out a ton of records, and we're all you know big fans and everything. But uh, they're also one of those bands that they they play on a lot of festivals, never as like usually a, a headliner type major act, but they're like always like some great support band, like hidden jewel. And so like, there's a lot of like clutch fans who are like hell yeah and you get to see them in the early evening or midday or something. But I think there's a lot of other people that go to those kind that are at those events that just randomly see this band and are just like, holy shit. You know, they're just like, they're really such a great, just sort of blue collar working man's, you know, rock and roll band, you know? Yeah. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Or just, Oh, they're great. Yeah. They're just great. Condoleezza rice is nice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I do. Last tyrant. uh, It was crazy. Cause I had just, I had moved back to Texas and I was, I don't think I was in Austin yet, but I was hanging out in San Antonio. I was kind of commuting back and forth before I moved up here and I was in San Antonio a lot. And I was hanging out with a, like my best friend I've known my whole life there. And we went to best, this is all, it tells you with the time frame. we went to Best Buy to buy a CD because my brother who was (laughs) out, still out in Los Angeles at the time was like, dude, you got to check out this band Clutch. And he was playing in a band hostile group with these guys from Boston, these East coast guys that, you know, and they were fans. And so I guess that's how he heard about them. And he was like, oh, you got to check out this band Clutch. They just put out a new record. And so we went to Best Buy and bought, bought, I I got Blast Tyrant, threw it in his truck. And I remember that it kicked off with the riff. And we're like, okay, this is cool. And I was like, we'll see what the vocals do, you know? And then he just got the way it just, the music drops and Neil Fallon just comes in like by himself. And then the whole like thing drops into that badass riff. And we were just like, both like, fuck yeah dude this band kicks ass (laughs) oh yeah great great band great sound they've been doing uh some live streams on maybe facebook youtube both just yeah i'm seeing a lot of little mini shows yeah yeah i I even saw uh guns and roses and metallic all these titan bands are doing this too so i don't know i I haven't been paying that much attention but um 
I don't know if they're doing it from actual concerts. I saw some footage of some people were at Sturges, so that's actually happening. Oh, that's cool. Um, I know a lot of other things have obviously been canceled. A lot of concerts have been pushed back to, you know, next year, which I think is, you know, smart, especially for yeah. big touring bands and big stuff like that. They have to, like, push it way, way out. And But, you know, so, yeah, what a time, man. It's a... I'm glad Crazy. that uh, you know. I'm glad that I'm pat well past the point to where I really give too much of a shit about leaving my house and feeling <laughs> like I have to be a part of things and go party downtown and all that crap. Yeah, and, you know, I went through that. Um, unfortunately, with you know, did all that kind of stuff, and and uh, you know, Same so here. I get that there's a lot of. I think it's probably harder for maybe when you're younger to kind of be like, oh, now you just have to stay at home and do nothing, you know, but. Uh, you don't want to miss out on anything, right? Yeah, you don't Just want to miss out something on anything. Happens, yeah. yeah, it's funny. It's funny how I, I always used to feel that way. Like the anxiety of of like, oh, I'm going to miss. Oh, I got to go support this band. I got, oh, there's a party here. Oh, there's this going on here and all this kind of stuff. And nowadays I'm just like, I don't want to do anything. I don't care. You know, the exception of like a very rare, like, oh, the this is something that I really, really like. And, you know, like seeing Mr. Bungle a few months ago or right before the pandemic. That was like the last thing. Mr. Bungle reforms and, and a deadly virus destroys the world. That's what that's that's the significance of that. But, yeah, I mean, that was I mean, that was something that was or when faith no more. Um, anyone who knows me knows I'm a, a big Patton fan and all and his yeah. related many of his related projects. So you saw that last tour a few times, didn't you? I saw, oh man, well, so the, yeah, yeah, I saw the Bungle thing, which and that now that new album, I just saw they put out a video yesterday, which was which is pretty cool for they're all, they're releasing a re-recorded album version of their original their first um, EP or whatever it was from back in '86, you know, kind of bootleg old tape. Oh yeah, you know, cassette. Okay. So with Dave Lombardo and speaking of Anthrax and Scott Ian on guitar and everything, and uh, oh damn, yeah. So saw them man, just brutal thrash metal old school show in uh san francisco in february right before the shit totally hit the fan so something like that i'm like yeah man that's cool this is something that happens never you know and same with when faith no more toured and it just so happened that uh another one of my great friends like guy laverick from england had come oh, yeah. visit in the summer and that's i right. was very kind of strategic in my planning because when faith no more did that tour in 2015 when they finally put a um had put out a record for the first time in you know I think it had been Soul Invictus, right? Yeah, and I think that was the last album they put out before that was maybe album of the year in like '97 or something. So it had been pushing, tw- you know, 18 years for that one. Yeah, because I, I, I met I met up with you guys at the show because it was at the Music Hall of all places, right what, before they shut down. Were we all? Were you there with that group? There was a whole group of us that went met up at some little like some bar before. Yeah, were you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. We we had some beers and then we went over to the Music Hall and actually. And, uh, that show balcony. Yeah. jesus man i got wasted like it's pretty <laughs> rare like that i get that smashed and uh i mean i remember that night getting absolutely hammered i i just remember that that place was rocking so hard and we were standing up on the balcony and the balcony was shaking and i was just like man i hope this thing doesn't fall yeah <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't oh, the greatest I, I think um is that place still open to the music hall? No, I think they shut it down finally. Really? Yeah, because it, it was kind of an interesting. I think I met up with you there again um, when Clutch played with Mastodon and uh, That's COC, right. and yeah. I was on the, We were on oh, the floor. Yeah. And I, that a floor yeah. was. I liked it a lot better than being up in the balcony for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, that was an absolute blast. And then it. So it just so happened though, before any of those, uh, the South dates were announced. They were had announced west coast and maybe some east coast stuff so i was like you know what screw it i have a bunch of friends in la and i actually think i hung out with pj uh we'll we'll talk to pj one of these <laughs> days a mutual acquaintance of ours oh yeah um, that uh yeah. i think Number i had three. even you know gone down there and hung out with him and th- back in 2015 in fact i'm almost positive because i was like super into f- fitness stuff at the time and I remember staying with him and we hiked, we like hiked up to the, the Griffith Park Observatory, whatever, whatever. I was like jo- getting up in the morning and like jogging around his block like a madman. We went to the gym for like two hours. I mean, I was like out of control back then <laughs> <laughs> and it's all gone to hell now. But I, I uh, remember that kick of yours. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. I mean, it, was, it was a good little while there, man. For a couple of years, I was pretty, you know, on the ball with it all. We, uh, cause we, you worked out with my trainer. Like we went to her house. Yeah, it's sort of she, PJ. And, yeah, and, and, and everything was great until our ass. Well, no, 
it was brutal, but I had a lot. I mean, it was really brutal. I couldn't even keep up at all. Like it was, it was bad. But then there was that time. Remember we did, well, we did a couple of like a park. There was some Lamar, some park we went to a few times. Oh yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. Air Peace crawls park. or whatever you call them and all that yep. crazy running up and down, hit all kinds of brutal shit. And then, uh, but then there was the time at her house when we were flipping those tires. <laughs> and all of a sudden, and then dragon. <laughs> and all of a sudden, PJ was like, we like heard a pop, and he was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, all right, fuck this. Oh. I'm not even going to try to lift up this tractor tire. Like it was, it was I, hardcore, man. I think didn't you have a gig after one of those workouts, and oh, you were trying, you were like, you went in the crowd, and then you tried to run up and jump up on the stage, and I think it was a dirty dog. And oh, like, I remember it, that. Yeah, it wasn't happening, and you had to walk around yeah. the stairs. And yeah. Climb up. <laughs> Oh man, there's been a few times that uh, the very first when we when AGR a Good Rogering toured in uh, 2017, the very first show of the tour in San Antonio, I did something stupid and like was like started the show off the stage or something, and I went to like run and jump on the stage like over a railing like up on a four foot stage or something, and just absolutely bit it and like like jacked up my knees and like i was oh. all like totally from like the very first day of the tour just like destroyed myself <laughs> but yeah man uh yeah those were uh fun times man what were we Sorry. talking about before i started talking about oh the dirty dog yeah no the working oh, out yeah yeah the working out, well, yeah. we used to go get and we used to go get those smoothies and all that kind of stuff man it always felt great to um you know one of the funny things about uh Back then, me and my buddy Dave, who we'll call in, we'll we'll talk to him at some point, I'm sure too. Like, uh, <laughs> and um, we've I've known him forever, like since junior high, and we've we've been close friends. And uh, he, uh, we, so we kind of went through this what we called the, you know our bra phase. Well, yeah, bra. You know what I mean? Like we were like the, <laughs> and we were super judgmental, you know, just because like oh look at these you know fatties eating their Taco Bell and this and that, and now I'm that guy all over again, you know, like just. <laughs> Zero self control, just pathetic. You know, it's like, like that scene in Fight Club where on, <sighs> they're on the bus and they're like, uh, what, they saw a poster or something. They're like, oh yeah, it's supposed to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's just funny, man, because when you get in that frame of mind, it's so you feel like really great about it, and it's and you're like, I can't believe I was never like. It's like cleaning an apartment when you're moving out. And you're like, shit, why didn't I always keep it like nice and clean? You know, it looks so great right now, but but you can't be hassled with it when you actually live there. You don't give a shit, and it's just like your body is the same way. We were so like into it, like I'll never again. I'm gonna work. You know, this is me now, and I'll never. And, and once you get off, I, it finally happened, man. I was solid for, for a few years and then I, I ended up like injuring my shoulder and you know what I mean? And, and I started getting back in at the time though, like, I think it was for me, it was cause I didn't have much going on ex- minus the teaching. I wasn't playing in bands and stuff for a few years. So I was, that was really what I was super focused on. And then once I got away from that and kind of gradually drifted away, you just, Next thing you know, you're just, you know, laying in bed with a Oreo crumbs all over your chest. And <laughs> it's so easy to do, though, right? I mean, it, hard one stuff's hard. One easy funny stuff, thing that <laughs> that I always remember about that time that was just funny to me was when I when I was into that and I had I used to go watch it for a while. I was watching all these like um, all these fitness tips and, you know, YouTube videos and all this different all, and all that. And you were I think you were doing. Didn't you have like a nutritionist and everything too, right? You were doing yeah. a boxing class. I don't know. You might still do the yeah. boxing. Um, I haven't. I'm going to start back up again. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, I had there was a night that I watched that movie, uh, the old classic uh, uh, Pumping Iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou oh, Ferrigno from like the great. late seventies. Yeah, class. <laughs> yes. And and I ate an entire box of Oreos while I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that was my cheat. That was my cheat day back then. Yeah, yeah they're, so, who knows? They're, they're busting out some squats, and and Arnold's telling me, "You can do it, you can do it." And the guy passes out on the floor, and oh yeah, kind of munching on some Oreos. Yeah, it's like no big. He's just like, oh yeah, if you don't vomit, like I, I throw up all the time when I when I work out. It's uh, <laughs> it's part of the deal. You got to push yourself. I'm like, damn, dude. That's why he's Arnold. That's it. Yeah, guy is a machine, dude. The whole he's like. Sleep for six hours, you know, like if you sleep longer, that you know, like, uh, what's this whole thing? He's like, sleep, sleep harder, sleep. <laughs> well, he always said that, uh, you know, why, what's the difference between people working out now versus back when you did? And he's like, 
He basically said that people rest too much, right? He's like, you should be doing six, seven, 12 sets, blah, 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 blah. You know, wow. your rest periods when your buddy's like busting out some, some, some curls and then he rests when you bust out curls. Like, Jeez. Yeah, man. It's, uh, well, according to him though, you know, he's, it's like he was always coming. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. You were, you spent some time in LA too, uh, at MI, right? Yeah, so after, uh, yeah, man, so I lived in San Antonio for a little bit, and that was like the, more or less the first time I ever got on stage, uh, kind of like late 90s, and then went to LA, uh, yeah, and went to music school for a little bit out there, which is where I ended up meeting um, my friend Guy, who I brought up, who lives over in England, and so then I went over to England and hung out there for a little bit, and uh, with him and his gracious family, and uh yeah, I was kind of bouncing around a little bit, very early 20s, stupid, you know, kind of kind of guy, and then eventually landed back back in Texas and decided Austin made the most sense, you know, in term for the for the music thing. Yeah, I I kind of did the same thing. Spent some time in California. Um went to boot camp out there in San Diego and then uh went through a couple of schools at Camp Pendleton got stationed in Washington state at a, at a Naval base as part of a Marine de- detachment. Then I made my way back down to Southern Cali. Saw a lot of great shows Saw Megadeth. Saw you know, just whoever was coming through there and then, uh, made my way back to Texas. So. Yeah. But, Cause uh, you're from, are you from Lubbock originally? Yeah. Just right outside. Yeah. 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 I'm from San Antonio. So yeah, I think it's, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, it's a, uh, something that often happens. You you move away, you, you go different places, and you come back to uh, somewhere sort of near near home. Like my brother, um, after I moved back, he was playing with that band Hostile Groove I mentioned, um, which I think uh, one of the guys in that band uh, has like lives in Boston or nearby again, um, and uh, and then the other guy lives out in, in L.A. still, but. Uh, my brother was with them for a while. Then he ended up moving back to Texas. And that's when, when he moved back is when we started that pitchfork band. And that was like our, our first sort of musical endeavor together. Like when we, I don't want to say reunited, but you know, when he came back to Texas and we were both living in Austin. Um, and, uh, and now he's out in San Francisco, man. And San Francisco is a, a really cool place. I really, but I mean, I love the weather. I'm a West coast guy because I love the weather out there. I like the California is great weather wise. Yeah. Weather wise. It's, it is quite amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, so San Francisco, I, I liked San, the whole Bay area, San Francisco. I, I went through a school up there on the East Bay, um, in Vallejo. There's a old shipyard that, that, yeah. uh, Vallejo actually, actually original, gets pretty hot from what I hear. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I trained out there for a little bit and then, um, had a couple of missions that I ran or that I was part of in uh back in the east bay but i got to visit san francisco san francisco quite a few times i've i've been back there since for work and um the weather's the same the the atmosphere the atmosphere is different you can tell it's just it's a different vibe now so that's that that's interesting right well think about how much how different austin is in in 15 years you know i mean oh yeah it's crazy how much this city is has grown just in the time that i've been here you know yeah and, um, I mean, I, I never had been out to San Francisco before, um, you know, the last, in, until the last few years since my brother moved out there. But, um, yeah, you know, it's funny when I was living in, in LA actually though, and I was right off of Hollywood Boulevard for, there were several places I lived around, uh, there, but initially, um, going to school right, right there, basically off Hollywood Boulevard, there was, uh, at the time, man, they were rebuilding a lot of stuff out there and there were a bunch of scaffolds up everywhere and it was a, a, a little bit dumpy, you know, a little bit kind of just meh, nothing to I mean, it was still Hollywood Boulevard and the tourist and the whole thing. But man, over the a course more of gritty back then. <laughs> yeah. And now it's like, you know, the last decade or so, it's just been Disneyland out there. You know, like they got a gallery up there and the whole big it's it's they really when I was there, like they were renovating and tearing down and rebuilding up a whole lot of stuff around that area. Kind of like, um you know, I guess with what you see with a lot of Austin now, you know, like it's yeah. just condos popping up and the, you know, a lot of all that stuff on East Riverside over there where the back room used to be and oh, come and take it right. live and stuff like that is now it's like tons apartments. of condos and apartments yep. and new businesses. And it's, 
very, very, very different, which is interesting. I was just talking about this with someone earlier. It's interesting because you've got all that um, growth over there and a lot of this snazzy new developments. And But they, there's also the whole, like, um, have you been down Riverside lately, man? And I, It's been a, maybe a few months since I was over that way, but there was, like, a whole bunch of tents and stuff in the middle, like, up and down. And I was just like, oh, holy shit. Like, it was very, like, the homeless thing, you know? Yeah. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is very... Um, I have not seen this. I mean, you expect it downtown and the whole seventh right. street area, you know, that area, but, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the word, what's the word for that, you know, um, homeless mm. tents. No, there, I feel like there yeah. was a phrase, but I can't think. And it was just, I was like, oh, wow, that's, um, it's, it was an interesting, um, <laughs> dynamic, you know, uh, just, uh, paradox. Just, uh, yeah. Just different now. Right. So it's, uh, well, it seems to be a lot more of it, I think. From what I can see, I haven't been down to East Riverside in a little bit. I think since, man, maybe one of the last shows, I think we met up there. Well, which show did we go see out there? Was it Metal Church? Jeez. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, that was a really fun night. Metal Church was great. Yeah. They still got it. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was cool because that was one of those bands, you know, has been lucky in the last few years to just open up for a few bands that, uh, you know, I like when I started playing, you know, it was like as a teenager. And I remember Metal Church was one of those bands that I've never really listened to a lot of them for probably, you know, 20 years. But in high school, it was like I had one of their cassettes and it was just like it didn't matter, man. If Metallica, Megadeth, Metal, anything with metal, anything that was metal was just like, yeah, cool. But I remember they had some great songs. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, man. And they, they kicked ass. And then oh, and then speaking of the Bay Area, like Death Angel, uh, playing with those guys was soup. those guys were you at that show or not that those guys were um, badass too man no i don't think so they were, they were really yeah. good and i didn't really know anything about that band i i, I was like oh death angel like thinking it was some kind of like morbid angel sort of like super death metal or something and they were like they're old school thrash you know oh badass. yeah they're one of those guys that they're one of those bands that were around i think at the same time as metallica and uh, you know all that all that bay area you know early 80s exodus all that kind of stuff you know oh yeah exodus i remember those guys man well i mean nowadays we're uh we're we're locked down it's uh, it's like a south park episode <laughs> it is no no kidding man well 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 stated i i was thinking about that earlier and i'm like man okay so you, you know every you go back and you look at all the different South Park episodes and they had one with, uh, I can't remember if it was like some sort of weather thing, global warming or, Oh, was it the, it was a parody of the, the day after tomorrow or whatever that movie was. Remember when, uh, the earth yeah. rose over. Uh huh. And, uh, and so it, it, it was that. And then, uh, whatever, pick pick your episode where like the town gets all riled up and they're all rabble 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 <laughs> right so <laughs> it's kind of it, it reminds me of that because it's a little crazy um you know obviously with the uh the pandemic and uh and just everything else going on all the all the protesters mostly it's, peaceful protesters. Oh, man it, it's like <laughs> I know there's there's been moments where I like we're just we're just living in some in some bad John Carpenter script right now, you know, movie like it's 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 surreal, man. It's like this weird you know just no, not dystopian, but almost, you know. It's just so weird with all the things that are happening together, with all the right and I and maybe they maybe they work off of each other. You know, you got a lot of people pent up and unable to do this and that. And then, you know, what happened? You know what I mean? Like the, the pot yeah. boils over. So I think that I, I do think that, um, with the, how much, um, has been going on in terms of protests. And then obviously the, the downside with the riots and, and the negatives, uh, you know, but I think it's just, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, pent up, you know, people that are pent up, that are frustrated, that are confused. Nobody knows what's going on. What are the facts? You know what I mean? Yeah. And you got this, you got this pandemic and people being told they can't do this and they can't do that. And then, and then just, you know, people start going ape shit. The, the funny thing to me is like, you know, 14 minutes after the thing started, you had guys protesting with AR 15s about their rights with, you know, in terms of like having to wear a mask. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, dude, like, I'm sorry, you know, but I do, I have not still 
to this day do not make a correlation in my mind how wearing a mask to protect thyself and others, even if it's just a courtesy thing, and even if it's just like, hey, maybe this helps, like let's just do it. It's not a big how that is a violation of my freedoms, I don't I don't know. I don't see it that way personally. Um, but I mean to me it's ironic that you had these this sort of like early protest happening and then look at where we are now and how crazy things have gotten, you know. Yeah. So well, it definitely could be worse. I mean, I, I've had to wear a, you know, gas mask before and Lord knows during, you know, MCT training, we had a whole, we had two platoons that had to wear mop, mop suits, which is, if you're not familiar with mop suits in the military, they're basically the these <laughs> non-breathable charcoal filled suits that you put on over your, your combat uniform to protect you from any nuclear biological chemical warfare. So wow. imagine having to, you know, hike up a mountain, hike up a hill with that crap right. on there. But so, I mean, it could be worse, right? So I don't mind the mask. <laughs> yeah. No. And I mean, I get that like, okay, is it a minor? Can, do I like having to go to the grocery store and put on a mask and, and then, you know, this is my choice of, you know, you come home and you wipe things down and you wash your hands and you feel it's annoying. It's, 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 you know, and I've always been a little OCD with that kind of stuff anyway. So for me, it's like, it's, it's, you know, mildly stressful and, 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 and a little bit annoying, but Hey man, like, is it, it's, like you said, I'm, we're not being asked to wear these, you know, let's go, you know, abduct et suits you know it's like we're <laughs> you know it's it's not that horrible i mean it's like put a bandana over your face dude like shut up you know how, yeah. how, why is this such a horrible thing for you anyway and i mean my whole thing is i think that in the grand scheme of things and all these different things that are happening right now with you know social movements riots you know protests uh defunding police reallocation of funds an election coming up i mean some people would would argue that it's all you know tied together in terms of some you know overthrow conspiracy or something but with all these kind of things going on i i just to me it's like just wearing a mask is not something that's even on my radar is something that is a, a big deal to me you know yeah and i think it's uh, i mean that's a it a personal opinion of mine that I've, I've had for certain reasons since this thing started. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, and it's just now it's like, who knows where things are going, man. You know, it's a very, it's just a, it's a very strange time. And I guess uncertain. And I think for anyone that can work from home and hasn't had their income, like totally decimated, you know, they're very fortunate on, on the, you know, but also I think it's really hard for a lot of, you know, families and people with kids, they, they're trying to work at home and deal with them. They got their kids at home all the time. So I know that can't be easy. Um, obviously musical, you know, arena is, is a disaster and, and sports is this weird thing now and everything is just super bizarre, you know, it's really bizarre. I mean, uh, you really feel for the folks that, that are, you know, they have their businesses that they can't open or maybe open on a limited basis. Um, but what I find interesting is that, you know, if you want to go out and protest, um, you know, you can. And it's just, I, I don't, I no, don't I think it's it. ridiculous. I, it's all, yeah. there's always this double standard with shit. And yeah. you know, the, the, what frustrates me too is, is like, just because if I'm someone over here that's saying, you know, going like, I think that, yeah, let's wear a mask. I don't have a problem with it being mandatory. And I think it, the reason it is in the first place is because so many people blatantly disregarded, you know, following the guidelines that were suggested in the first place. And that's why yeah. we, we keep ending up in the same mess and school with school now about to start. And Labor Day coming up and all this, I'm sure we'll see, who knows, see another spike. I mean, it just keeps happening over and over. Yeah. And so I think um, it's like, look, this is, we need to accept the situation and try to deal with it. But but having said all that, I'm not someone that's gone like, that's sitting here saying, shut everything down. No, these assholes that are like, oh, just hide in your house. I'm like, no, I'm not for that at all. Like, I'm like, look, we need to have things open. We need to have businesses open. And I'm, but they need to be able to act responsibly and they need the patrons to fucking cooperate so that they don't get shut down. When you have a bunch of assholes going to a bar, not following guidelines, you're fucking over all the other bars by behaving that way, you know, in my opinion. So, yeah, I and think, I, I'm not. Out of, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> no, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm not all that convinced that these, you know, I think the news said that uh, we aren't seeing any spikes from the protests. I'm not convinced of that that you know, doesn't even make sense to me and i'm not i'm no. not i'm not advocating for or against protests in fact i mean in terms of protesting that's a that's a right that we have in this country it's a beautiful right and i'm all for it it during it doing it during a pandemic is unfortunately not super ideal and i mean i think it's just absurd to believe that 
you can have any amount of people in close proximity anywhere under any circumstance and not have some sort of risk involved. So it's not something that you can just cherry pick, you know, and that's what, but right. that's, that tends to be what happens d- depending on whoever's, you know, supporting or not supporting a certain endeavor, you know, whether it be a bar right. opening or a protest or whatever. And it's like, I think the best thing that we can do right now is just try to support, especially local businesses, try to, and try to do everything we can to, take those precautionary measures and be safe, which now is mandatory in a lot of places, obviously, you know, yeah. to, so that these businesses can stay open. And if people want to protest and they do it peacefully, I mean, I still think that should be a right. You know, you can't tell people that, you know, I it just, at the end of the day though, it's like, you know, you've got to make some kind of compromise. And if that means wearing a mask and social distancing a bit, so be it, you know, I don't now if, if we're still doing this three years from now, okay. Okay. Let's talk. Okay. But, Six months in, not even like, I think it's, you just kind of have to do the best you can right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at places like Japan, right? They, I mean, even before this whole thing broke out, they were, you know, you see them wearing masks all the time, right? Just being courteous. And I think their infection rate has been relatively low compared to everybody else. They might've had a spike recently. I think they're trying to hunt that down, but, uh, but for the most part, I think they have it under control and contained, right? Because that's, that's kind of, that's the stuff they do on a day-to-day basis anyway. So, yeah. well, they feel, and it seems like, uh, and it's a broad, you know, statement, but in sort of Asian countries, like, because there's been these situations in the past, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. Like they're like, Oh, this is something that's happening. We're all going to wear our masks now because that's what you do. So we can try to not spread this thing and contain it. You know, I don't understand why uh, anyone that's not, that doesn't use that logic doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, <laughs> um, I just, again, I, to, to me, it's not a, it's not a freedom issue uh, that I see personally, you know? Yeah, no, I agree there. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like the mask issue is old news at this point. Americans are very bored very quickly. So <laughs> masks was so April, May, like that's, you know, what, who, where will we be in six months? What will be, what will be the new thing? You know? Uh, murder hornets or uh yeah murder hornets came for like 15 seconds i mean dude everything under the it's like you know i kind of got off social media for a few days and geez it felt great and i I haven't watched the news as much and you just you feel so much better because everything is just death and and tox i mean murder hornets and then it was like oh a mosquito was just found with west nile virus and what would some there was some other the the plague a squirrel has the plague (laughs) all this just (laughs) fucking shit man Uh. Dragon Force is making a comeback. Dragon Force is making a comeback. <laughs> I mean, just horrible news all around. News, yeah. Another guitar lesson with Herman Lee figuring out an A major seven arpeggio for, for the music nerds out there. And the guitar. Yeah, I had a I had a coworker one time talk about Dragon Force, and he was just so jazzed about a dude playing guitar. And I'm like, dude, just get away from me. <laughs> um, I feel like you can maybe make anything cool depending on the context, but I don't think dragon force is the right context. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's funny when I started teaching, there was this big at the time guitar hero. Oh, Jesus Christ. Guitar hero was super (laughs) speaking of style park. One of the most brilliant episodes ever. (laughs) And the guitar hero episode, but all these dipshit teenagers were super into guitar hero. And then like, I actually had a kid one time where I was figuring out, and it was it was really big. It was like at the time there was stuff like Avenged Sevenfold had really started. I just think had it was a big thing. Not that they aren't still like big, but um, and then bands like uh, I don't know Trivium and I, I mean I don't know, dude. I don't know how to describe these early two thousands yeah. type bands that are sort of like the not screamo, but you know what I mean. Like yeah, it's like the yeah, Kill Switch Engage type where it's like a melodic ver, uh, uh, you know, a screamy verse with like really syncopated, you know, crazy rhythms. And then some like melodic chorus where they sing about like how much pain they're in or something, you know? And like, yeah, it's uh, like pretty boy angst. Yeah. It's weird. It's weird. Like and like, I've never like entirely gotten that kind of music because on the one hand, I think some of it's really awesome, but then some, but then I'm just like, 
I don't know, man. It just has never, like, a lot of that stuff has never really done it for me. Anyway, it was big at the time. Guitar Hero was big at the time. And I'd have these kids, you know, kind of flipping their hair like the South Park, you know, and, hey, can you do, like, the Evan Sevenfold, bleh? you know, and it's like, bro, you haven't even learned a G chord yet, man. And, oh, dear, but well, you, well, you didn't do, like, when he plays it and Guitar Hero, it's like orange, orange, red, and you didn't do, and, like, dude, like, that happened, like, was that the kid that was eating a burrito during your lesson? No, that kid was a full blown psycho. Like, yeah, I had this kid one time that was came in my gu- guitar class, like just r- r- yeah, dropping a Taco Bell burrito all over the floor for starters, and he was like waving his guitar around like a psychopath, wanting to learn "Devil Goes Down to Georgia." Would sit and one of those guys that sat like way too close, and I mean everything about him was just weird and awkward. And I was like, "This dude is going to be a serial killer." <laughs> <laughs> So I don't, I don't know, man. I remember that dude. Yeah, he, was, he was the only guy spooky. ever yeah. had that the school actually had to call his parents. And I think they, cause he was harassed. He would talk to other people and like make people uncomfortable in the lobby and stuff. And he was like, it was very strange. And for a while, I think we were, had given, we would give out our cell number for, I don't even remember the context or why now it doesn't, <laughs> you know, you know, from that's right. That yeah. experience is very contrary to what the owner, um, you know, would have wanted it seemed seemingly, but, um, uh, anyway, and then I get a call one night where I was walking downtown for a gig and I'm just like, what the fuck? A number I didn't recognize it. So I don't answer. And then I, you know, he proceeded to leave a five minute voicemail of him going, Hey man, I want to learn this kid rock song. It goes like this and like holds his phone up to the speaker. And I just hear, you know, <laughs> you know, for <laughs> three minutes. I'm like, dude, what oh, is wrong man. with you, man? Like there's, there's some crazy motherfuckers. And I mean, I'm crazy, but shit, like there are some crazy, crazy people in this world. Some strange dudes. Yeah. Some strange dudes. Yeah. yeah. So who knows? Yeah. I, I, dude, it's funny you bring that up. I'd forgotten about that guy, man. Yeah. We've <laughs> all had any of us teachers. We used to just talk mad shit. Cause fortunately nowadays, man, I've got students that, like I said, like some people I've known for that are, there's, you know, that are friends that I met, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, you know, I've just had so many different students at this point over the years. And, um, and a lot of them are great. Some of them are, a phenomenal amazing musicians and people it's just it's such a gratifying awesome thing to be a part of but then you know on the flip side of the coin you have that kind of stuff where you're like jesus christ you know i i can't believe i went to music school and 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 you know what i mean like this is this is it's degrading <laughs> just when you're when you're in, I do i do not like babysitting i'll put it that way yeah yeah it is not why i teach music <laughs> I do remember that dude. Yeah, I, Keenan was really thrilled with him, I, if I remember right. Yeah, I think Keenan was. Uh, yeah, had some choice <laughs> words. <laughs> the one oh, fun yeah. thing about them, though, is that, that about that job back then was we all knew each other, you know. And I mean, the the place I work at now, Lone Star School of Music, is is cool too. Like everyone's. I mean, now we're doing everything virtual. Well, not everything, but I am, and a lot of guys still are. Um, you know, and it's the same thing. It's like everyone's super cool. I know a lot of people. There's a lot, it's a lot bigger staff in several locations, and people come come and go. But uh, but back then, uh, at at that school, it was just like it was so cool because it was kind of just a tight knit, you know, just a little circle of instructors, and we all knew each other. And whenever we had those shit students that you know they're they get dropped off and they just want to sit there and pout because they don't get to play video games for 30 minutes while their mom goes into randall's and grocery shops you know i'm like well you know what fuck you kid and, <laughs> and uh, you know like we'd be in the we'd be in like the copy room just like talking shit and wasting time I, my, my, I remember my brother talked there too and there was this time he had just had this little monster and he went back and he was just like hanging back having a conversation with keenan or something and then he said he fought for like half the lesson and he said he finally came back and, the, and he saw that the kid was like on his phone with his mom saying like, oh, yeah, he finally walked back in or whatever. And he was just like, oh, shit, I'm about to go, <laughs> I'm about to get a text message, a phone call, a, a piece of paper note on my chair. Oh yeah, my we goodness. got we got reprimanded severely when uh, when us independent contractors did not uh, meet the specifications of, of, the, uh, of the owner of, the, of that <laughs> establishment. That that was another uh, little unifying aspect there at the school was the uh, the guy in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, he was a character. Yeah, if I it, I remember that gig that uh, you and your brother helped out on the Salt and Pepper, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> classic. Yeah, I love being referred to as Salt and Pepper. That was a classic moment. I'm, I'm the steak. You guys are the Salt and Pepper. 
Yeah, yeah, that was that. Those words were said to me when I was uh, when I was playing some keyboard. It's like, hey, can you just uh, like not do so much? I'm the steak. You're the salt and pepper. But yeah, we played that gig. It was at Momo's for God's sake. Another place that's, that's gone. Right. I think they got busted for some cocaine ring or some crazy shit. Right? Remember that? I would not be surprised. Yeah, a few yeah. years ago, like a whole uh, there was a big big crackdown on a bunch of a drug ring in some bars or something. Anyway, yeah. Momo's, which uh, I never really played at much there. I don't know a lot about it. It seemed like uh, it was a good spot for some douchey bands, I suppose. I'm mean, not to say like a lot of good bands didn't play there too, of course, but but we we uh, yeah, that was one of the you know it's funny because of that one gig is why I got a keyboard. I never had a freaking keyboard. I always had a piano, <laughs> right. but I never had a keyboard. And and I play now with a lot of the bands I play, and I play keyboards exclusively or as much as guitar and. You know, and so I've done a lot of different recording and, and I, you know, teach, like I said, I used to teach piano exclusively over at that school. And so, um, but that's what the catalyst for me getting that was because of that gig, because I was like, well, shit, man, I'm a little, I haven't really practiced much. He asked us if, you know, my brother played bass and I played keyboards while he sang and played guitar and did, you know, guitar, you know, storytelling stuff. And uh, <laughs> that's right. And, and it was, it was uh, MTV storytellers M- or something. M- M- MTV storytellers. And so I was like, and so I was like, okay. And so he let me borrow the keyboard and I was like, okay, this is cool. You know, so I was like, well, this is a cool way that I can have a, a keyboard, you know, to practice on. And, uh, but then I was just like, Jesus Christ, I don't want to do any more of these gigs and I don't want to have that. Oh, I don't want to have be under his thumb in that way, you know? So I was just like, never mind. I'll just buy a fucking keyboard. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just ended up buying a keyboard after that show. Oh, that was still got it, night. man. Still got my yeah. old Casio. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a few now, man. It's been pretty cool. I've gotten some really cool deals on, uh, on some, on some various keyboards. I just got a new cur- a curse vial, as as Josh from the Invincible Czar says, uh, that I was going to tour with when we were going to tour in April and do the West Coast tour all the way up to Vancouver. And of course, oh. that did not, that did not happen. Yeah, that's the one that's thing. Like, place. I'm not really missing, to be honest. Like the playing much locally and stuff. It's I and everyone who kind of knows me is knows that more recently I've kind of been like, yeah, you know, I want to be more picky about the, the gigs. I don't really want to play a lot of local shows just for the sake of playing. Yeah. Um, just have, well, you're, you know, doing, a, you're doing quite a bit too. I mean, you, I have, well, I have a lot of projects now. Yeah. I mean, things have just really compiled. I mean, I, like I said, I was like, man, I don't, I barely set foot on stage from 2000, mid 2012 till 2000, late 15 or early 16. Was when we started, like a good Roger and came back around. So it was like a three year gap in there, which we put out an album, but we didn't play. We didn't have a drummer. And then my brother got married and moved, and it was just like the whole thing was kind of turned upside down. And so I, I was doing a little more studio stuff, I, a few things out at Mesa, which we mentioned earlier, and um, and then just teaching, you know. And then I had kind of done some sub gig gigs and played bass with one band a little bit and done a few things. But man, and since 2016, it's just kind of like. It just kept compiling. And so now yeah. it's like, um, and I've had to turn down a few different projects, you know, things that I, that would be super, I would have been like super stoked to do several years ago or even maybe a few years ago, but I just don't have the time to put into it now. You know, I just, I gotta like really pick my battles, you know? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you've got, so you've got, uh, you know, the AGR stuff, you've got a uh, rune scar, r- r- right? Rune scar. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you play with bull. Bully Los Buffaloes. Buffaloes. Yeah. yeah, which was cool to see that there was a couple of songs on the Mayans TV show. Yeah, yeah, man, that yeah. guy. Yeah, that was so very, very cool. And Bull is great, man. It was super, super cool guy. I've really enjoyed working with him. We had, um, again, speaking of Mesa Recording Studios here in or, uh, Austin and Del Valley area, like um, I had met him at like initially at like a pool party that they had out there. Oh, and yeah, my yeah. first impression of him was just like, what a douche. <laughs> he's this huge, he's this huge, like, we, we should have Bull on the show sometimes. He's this huge, like, he's, I think he's like 6'8", six, 6'7", six, six, Jeez. Massive dude from Spain, right? Got the accent, got the whole look, you know. Yeah. And the first time I ever met him, he was out there. I think I had maybe heard about him. I actually, no, you know what? We were at a, uh, we were at a, um, a function for, like, the recording academy. Like, they have a couple of parties every year and i think it was like a christmas function and that that was the first time i think i saw him and he had his, an acquaintance of his new rob and da, da 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 so anyway so he started working with rob and i had heard about him didn't hadn't really met him I, I, that i can remember and he was just really drunk at this party 
And I remember he was talking uh, to to some friends and and calling this. <laughs> This is one of his funny calling this guy. He's not a big hipster fan. He's like, oh, you little, you're a little hipster man. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, <laughs> and I think it was like hitting on someone's girlfriend and shit. And I was like, dude, this guy's an asshole. Oh but, man. And I tried to like, be like, Oh, Hey man, I've heard about you. I'm skunk. And he was just like blitzed. It's you know, and you get it kind of, sometimes you give people a pass when they're like super out of their mind. It's like that. I, did I tell you the time about, uh, when I quote unquote met Matthew McConaughey, no. <laughs> so Matthew McConaughey one time was uh, at uh, I was on a on a date at this uh, oh, there's there's the con- there's the Continental Club and there's that gallery there's that gallery whatever above it you know what oh, I'm talking yeah. about there's that other yeah, little place yeah. yep so there was this time I, I went over there and um actually there's a couple of, man there's there's been a couple of really cool things that happened there like and I don't know if this was the same night or not but one time I went, popped up there and it was when ZZ Top had played at the backyard or whatever That's it was called right. and Billy Gibbons just popped Billy in Gibbons. there and it just yeah. I was sitting like 5 feet from Billy Gibbons and he just starts playing um you know just jumps on stage starts playing like Red Volcar used to play there all I mean he used to Hey Bell used to play yeah. they, they probably still play at Continental so that guy popped up there and I think Billy Gibbons was there hanging out with Red Volcar and uh, but anyway, there was this this cool funky jazz band. I can't remember what they were called. They were really great, and they were playing. Um, uh, they were playing, and so the girl I was with, like we were kind of hanging out. There was nobody really in there, and we went in the back room. There was like a little back area with a ping pong table. We went back there for a while, and we came back out, and it was like all of a sudden it was like really packed, you know. And people are hanging around. There's you're, there's probably still like maybe fifty people in there. It's pretty small, but if that, there's this one guy up front, and he's just fucking going for it man just dancing away just having the time of his life and we're just kind of like you know having kind of having a laugh at this this bozo you know turns out this motherfucker is matthew mcconaughey (laughs) and he was just drunk off his ass yeah but uh anyway that was a side a side tangent but uh, in terms of people just being blitzed you know so bull was like super super hammered the first time i met him but then i got called in to do um you know will knack who plays with blue oh, october yeah. now and we you know i've known will for many years and well, used to play used with to him giddy ups back in the that's day right. man yeah that's right i remember yeah, when i moved here man pitchfork yeah. we used to play giddy ups and the owner really loved us they always took care of us they uh they, they i mean it's a little a little dive man but I, I met a lot of good people there and we used to play there all the time when i first moved here any any that like, fun, like yeah fun place my longtime friends are all like oh yeah i remember the giddy up days you know and uh yeah but that's where I met Will, man. He'd play there all the time, and he always had great players with him. And he's played with like every band under the sun at this point. Um, but anyway, he had recorded an album with uh, Bull, and but they called they ended up calling me in to do one of the like the title track song that he actually wrote with Yayo. Do you know Yayo Kiss guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yayo actually, I think wrote that, co-wrote that with him. But anyway, so I ended up being the one that that played uh, on on that song on the album, and uh, and so then after that, he called me in for a couple more. He did a couple of singles, so I I went and did the studio sessions for that, and then it just kind of worked out that you know I think his his guy his live guy you know didn't work out or whatever the case was. He was in guitar between players, so I was like, mm, okay, man, we'll see. I'll do a show. Blah blah blah. And yeah, man, I've had a, a blast playing with him. He's a really cool guy. And not only the Mayans thing, which was, uh, which is awesome, you know, to have, have songs on, on that, uh, TV show, but also, uh, this last, uh, January, we went out to the NAM show and I've done the NAM show many times with Tragen guitars. And now a couple of times, a couple of years now with Godin guitars, you know, and there's a, a few other companies that I've done some stuff with, but, um, to be, to go out there and be with Gibson was just absolutely amazing, you know, and bull made yeah. that happen. So that, That's awesome. dude, that was pretty amazing. Like being out there and, and, you know, back to the, 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 the bands you're influenced, uh, by in high school, like one of my favorite bands was, was Skid Row. Like I still love Skid Row and Slave to the Grind is like such a great, great album, you know? Oh yeah. And, uh, and so I was like, always oh, this huge Skid Row fan and like, boom, like I'm, I mean, we, I, I was fortunate enough to get to op- open for him a few years ago at come and take it live here. And like kind of met Snake and talked to him for a minute and he was he was super cool, but um didn't didn't meet everybody. And then here I am like hanging out in the Gibson, you know, lounge, whatever. They had, it was just the artist lounge. It was like my only like moment I've ever been like, holy shit, like this is this is what it's like to be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> like got to go like go backstage and like literally just walk on stage, like on a huge ass stage and pick up a guitar and play. Like, oh man, this is cool. 
didn't have to set anything up and do shit, you know. But uh, yeah, just hanging out and like all of a sudden, you know, oh shit, oh I'm just, now Skid Row is like standing here in the buffet line with me. Okay, cool. Hey, what's going on? You know, talk to those guys for a minute. And Adam Jones from Tool ran into him. Jerry Cantrell, who was a little harder to talk to, he he was a little irritated because he had to pee. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and there was a whole there was a whole slew of like amazing musicians at in you know in and out of that that the whole time yeah. we were there so it was it was yeah man so so bull is uh he's, he's got some really cool you know cool stuff going on and has made some really in fact we were originally going to play this uh sturges was the plan you know before all this happened and right and uh had talked about we were going to do the nam we were going to do the nam show in july in nashville and do a tour uh you know try to do some dates on the way up there and everything and and um everything's just kind of obviously been put on hold but yeah playing with him has been really cool been playing with him a few years obviously rune scarred oh back to skid row though dude um the speaking of dragon force i always forget this guy's name <laughs> it's like fucking oh, god damn it what is it i'm gonna have to google this pz I, that's not his name hold on skid row is it the, the keytar player <laughs> yeah it's skid row's new keytar player oh shit there you uh, go <laughs> Hold on, as I, I I must know this now. What is his name? Um I mean they're all like really cool guys too, man, but um Z ZP, yeah, yeah. He I'm almost positive he used to sing for uh Dragon Force. No way. And he's fucking awesome, dude, with Skid Row. Like he's 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 great. They're they're really, really good. Like the last I like I saw him again in uh October of 2018 i guess and yeah really really good man on point obviously cool. everyone would love to see sebastian bach you know back in there but i don't know if that'll ever happen but yeah i think yeah. i think they're they're killing it right now they're supposed to have a new album coming out this year we'll we'll see what happens hmm. but uh yeah man that that guy <laughs> it's too bad you uh didn't get to go and do the uh fender booth and hang out with Ingve. Well, no, I mean, I have never actually met Ingve. My friend Guy's met Ingve, and he said he was really cool, you know. But I, I really? know there's a lot of other reports that he's not. I mean, Ingve definitely comes off as pretty pompous, and the the classic story Ingve story for me is just seeing him at, him at Nam when he had a huge life size cutout of him at the Marshall booth, and there was this huge stack of Marshall amps, and then a cutout of him, and I turned the corner. And I saw it, and then I see the back of somebody standing there looking at it with his fists on his hips, kind of like admiring it, you know? <laughs> and it was fucking Ingve looking at himself. <laughs> how big How big was this cutout? Uh, life size I, or bigger? I, I want to say it was life life size. Yeah, maybe okay. back. It's been a while. Like that was years ago, but it was pretty. And I, well, I mean, you turn the corner, you see this guy, and you're like, and then you see the puffy shirt and the long hair and the whole thing. And you're like, wait <laughs> frilly, a minute. The frilly shirt. Like and I had to, I kind of had to do that. I kind of had to do that sideways, like sneaky, pretend I'm looking at an amp and like side eyed to see if it was Ingve kind of thing, you know, <laughs> but very similar to the way, like when I met Lemmy years ago at the rainbow, uh, uh and, oh, and, 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 and uh, LA, like, uh, I was standing, like, he's standing there at the cigarette machine. Right. And I'm just standing there and I'm looking, I look over and I'm like, holy shit is that Lemmy? you know he's got a hat on he's got the leather and the whole thing and but i was like i want to be sure and so i do this like really bad like pretending to look at this, the, the cigarette selection while i'm like trying to like see if i can spot the moles on the other side of his face <laughs> no Lemmy was great man Lemmy was like so fucking no bullshit just yeah great well they put on a great show i think i i remember seeing them at stubs i think outside, we saw them outside. with with yeah right with black was that another that was black label yeah it was maybe. black label yeah. yeah that's right and he had the uh he had the roadie that would come out and refill the beer on his mic stand right he had like a little cup oh yeah on his mic yeah. stand and the roadie would run out there and like that's throw right. fresh beer in there that was awesome yeah man yeah I, I feel like uh that may have been the only no you know what um i think that's the only time i ever saw motorheads strangely enough because i was supposed to see them Oddly enough, I believe they opened for Heaven and Hell and then Judas Priest at a, you know, a San Antonio show one time, but I missed them. We got there late. But I got to see Heaven and Hell with Dio, which was badass. And then Judas Priest was just so great, man. They were playing like all the all the painkiller tracks, which I just oh, for me, like that was one of the album. that early nineties. I mean, I, I was like, it was just amazing, man. The stuff that was coming out in 91, 92, black album, the use your illusion stuff. 
all the, you know, the Dallas and Chains of Soundgarden, all that Seattle stuff was still happening. Rust in Peace was 90. Countdown was 92. You had Faith No More as Angel Dust. You had... um, you had uh, uh, Sound of White Noise when Anthrax sound changed Sound of White singers. Noise when you had John Bush, which is still like uh, amazing. That's one of my man. favorite. Yeah, yeah that was favorites. that was really, and all that stuff was at the forefront back then too. Yeah. And the early '90s, like it was, all Dirt came out in '92. All that stuff was in the mainstream. It was, it was insane. I feel like the late '60s and the and the the late '80s, early '90s were just like meccas for for rock. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Same here. And. uh you know, you, you talked about kind of like the, yeah, you, you talked about kind of like the newer stuff, uh, of Vengeful Seven and kind of this angsty. I can't tell the difference between those guys. It's like all these different bands and it just kind of sounds the same to me. Yeah, I know. It's, I it's know. probably it's something that makes us sound like old and not old to say, to say that because you always <laughs> yeah. think that in it. But I, and, you know, I'm definitely not one of these guys either that's like, oh, pop music sucks and this sucks and that sucks. Like, there's a lot of really great pop music and a lot of oh, yeah. new, new bands and a lot of stuff that I like. And I understand that a lot of that, the the intent is for is, is to be simplistic in the same four chords, and that's fine. But I know it's, 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 I feel like there's certain bands that they have such a distinct identity, like Alice in Chains or Tool or... I mean, you're not going to, the singer, all the things about them are just so unique. You cannot mistake that band. And there's so many bands, like even Corn. like honestly, I've never been like that into Corn. Like I could not fucking believe when I saw Corn with Alice in Chains on this last tour. Put on a People great were show. losing their minds over Corn. Yeah. Dude, I will give them credit though, because they have, they were very unique and original. Like, I don't know of any other band that really sounded like fucking Corn before Corn. Yeah. you know? And so, well, even, yeah, even like the newer stuff, like not to bash on the newer stuff, but it, you, Lincoln Park was you know, excellent. I've seen them live. Yeah, I never saw them. I never, I don't know much about them. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of times too, you'll see a band live and go, wow, this is a really great, that is the mark of a great band because there's a plenty of bands. Perfect example. And these are guys, great musicians. I'm not discounting them as musicians, but the Chili Peppers, like the classic Blood Sugar Sex Magic, Mother's Milk, like, those are classic albums. I, I really like that old Chili Pepper stuff. I thought some of the, the the later stuff was a little lazy. It wasn't. It didn't really float my boat personally. Uh, so I, I would. Ne- I'm not a guy that's like I love the Chili Peppers. I don't hate the Chili Peppers, but I'm not like a massive. Ch- but seeing them in ACL, seeing them live, you're just like fuck. These guys kick ass. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And that's the thing is like on the flip side of that coin, um, I saw. I think the Black Keys have a lot of really great songs. Like they've got a lot of good, catchy, hooky tunes. It's real simple, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, bluesy hipster rock. I don't know what you would call it, but like I, I think a lot of those kind of, you know, hipsters, hipster little hipster man like them, but like uh but they're good they're good songs. But I saw them live and to be honest, I was bored out of my fucking mind. You know, yeah. and like not every concert has to be like some maniac running around stage, but I just felt it it just fe- felt really sterile and boring to me. Whereas a band like the Chili Peppers, like, I don't really like listen to a lot of their music, but they were so fucking good live. I was just like, man, yeah. And you understand why bands are, you know, why they've been around for 30 years or more or whatever, because right. longer than that now, 35, probably like they're the energy it down. Man, yeah, yeah, they're good. You know, Meta- same goes for Metallica. I mean, Metallica is such an interesting band because I think they have both put out some of the greatest you know, rock, hard rock metal music of all time, undeniably master of puppets. And I don't care what anyone says. I think Ma- uh, black album is an absolute masterpiece as well. Uh, and justice. I mean, all they're all great, you know, and then, and then you've got stuff like St. Anger, which is baffling, just <laughs> yes. baffling, but it still sold like 3 million copies or something. But those guys, it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter when, it, whatever was going on with them or whatever was going on with the, whatever album they were making, they've always been great live you know and yeah. so that's and i think that can sell a band i'm sure there's a lot of bands that i'm i could very easily just be like bleh, and then i'd see them live and be like oh shit okay i get that like, they're fucking really good you know and i think yeah, most I, bands with longevity you kind of you have to have that element you know yeah i've been that way too i i've seen or i've heard bands that i wasn't i wasn't too into and then i've gone to a live show and it's like wow these guys kick ass and just the opposite right i've been into some bands where you know, these guys are really great. And I go watch a show. And I'm like, eh, they're kind of boring. <laughs> you know, so yeah. It's, yeah. It's so disappointing yeah. when you see a band and they're just not, not doing yeah. anything for you live. And again, I, I don't know, man. I mean, it's different stuff. Some people, I think some people like, you know, they're okay with 
I mean, and one guy might see, you know, a band and say it's this is the greatest concert I've ever seen. And someone else might say this is the most boring shit I've ever seen. Like, but I think like there are certain artists and bands, of course, where it's almost undeniable. Where, like, for instance, like I've seen Roger Waters twice, and it just like blew my fucking mind like a million times over. Like, it's just so next level. You know what I mean? Like, seeing the wall is just yeah, un- an unbelievable man. You know, I think it depends on the venue too. Right. I mean, one of the things that's true. Yeah. I, I, I've been to the, yeah. A, yeah, I've been to ACL festival a couple of times and I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Yeah, I have no real the desire to do it. Again. <laughs> oh yeah. No, it's, it's too crowded. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. You know, it, yeah. You're just huffing all over the place. The, uh, the way the stages are set up, there's all this sound bleeding into the next yeah. you know, stage. And it's just, uh, yeah, I've caught a couple of good shows, but, um, you know, TV on the radio is really good. I like their energy, but it was the sound wasn't great because they were, you know, there was this big rock behind them and mm-hmm. just sound bleed over was coming from another side. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not all that thrilled with ACL Festival. I'm not, uh, you know, well, I'm, I don't even think it's happening, obviously, this no. year. No. So, yeah, I think it. I think it's uh, canceled this year. Which well, uh, I think it's you know, like well. a lot of things, and I don't know all the ins and outs and everything. Uh, um, you know, I know it's a C three thing, and C three is huge and puts on a lot of things. And and I know some people that work there, so I, I don't have any like, you know, negative things to say in that aspect. But I think it's like, and I get the politics of it all. Like the, the unfortunate thing that happens all the time is like it's it. You know, it's like. Whereas, you know, that's the ir- irony with Austin so much, too, is like this, oh, South by Southwest and AC. None of this shit has anything to do with Austin bands anymore. Like, no, Austin bands don't. All. They're like anyone that has ever submitted. Me, you know, there's a handful. There's a few. But you really have to get your foot in the door and you really have to to shake the right hands, I think, uh, to yeah. to make that happen. And I mean, I, I definitely know of a few bands that are in that circle, but most aren't the vast majority aren't and i think it's really ironic and just lame that you have bands fucking paying to submit to shit like this and then there's no way in there you're not i mean that's who the fuck's take that's bullshit man that's why i started skunk fest because i was like fuck all these people that are fucking over musicians and just taking their money you know yeah and yeah i think initially acl fest you know it was like two days or something and it was like uh you know a lot of Austin bands, a lot of local Texas bands at first. And then maybe like the third year is when it kind of branched out yeah, and started bringing in all these other acts and which is cool. But I mean, yeah, like you said, it's just kind of gotten away. There's not, it doesn't, I don't know. I, I, I don't dig it. I know a lot of people like it. They love it. That's their favorite time of the year. They enjoy it. They take time it's off of work. It's also to become, go to all. Yeah, it's also become something that's not necessarily for the Austinites. It's for all the other people coming into town, and it's a huge tourist yeah. thing. I'm sure, bump. I'm sure like it South brings, brings in tons of revenue. It's this huge, massive thing, and that's fine. But it, uh, but as far as like an Austin musician or, or a lot of Austin people are go, they're like, we want absolutely no part of it because it's like, ugh, yeah. you know, like this is certainly does nothing for me, and it's just a pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. So I hate traveling on those weekends. You know, if I'm, if I'm flying out going somewhere for work, I can always tell if it's South by Southwest or if it's uh, ACL, right. One of the weekends for ACL, cause it's just packed. Mm-hmm. Like the, the airport's ridiculous. You're trying to fly out or you're flying back in. And it's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. What Man. else do we do to make us ourselves sound old and jaded? <laughs> Should we talk uh, about how we hate black lives matter? <laughs> <laughs> I'm old and white. Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Old and white. I'm old and brown. So, uh, yeah, that, gosh, that I, I'm kind of through with that. Uh, the I, sentiment, I, I get the sentiment, right? I mean, obviously yeah. we had this, we had this opportunity to come together as a country and, you know, something horrible happened to a dude. And, uh, you know, they, we definitely need to look at some things as far as, uh, rules of engagement, what we can or can't do. But then it just kind of narrowed and we had all these, it, it's like this takeover of just these really radical folks, you know, Marxists, I, I should say, or they're self-proclaimed Marxists, right? And they're just these demands that are just all over the place, right? It's like they they're they want you to post a, a black square. They want you to kneel. They want you to say this. They want you to say that to prove you're not racist. And it's like, eh, I mean... Yeah, yeah, I no. think uh, I think the minute like, yeah, and, and I think it, it's regardless of the, of the situation, when you start 
you know, uh, and I'm not saying this about anyone in particular, but just like when you start making demands on anyone that you, you have to comply with this or else it's like, well, now you're, this is definitely not a, a road to progress, you know? Right. And, and I, I agree a hundred percent, the sentiment and the peaceful protesting, I'm, I'm four to a thousand percent, you know? And I, but I think like with most things, what, what happens with, 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 with everything, unfortunately is, you know, you get a lot of good people uh, behind something with a lot of good intentions, but it only takes a, a few bad apples to completely spoil something and, and yeah. fuck it all up. And so things are always like that. You're always getting hi- hijacked. I remember one time I, there was a whole bunch when all the, you know, we were had this great unity as a nation after the you know, 9-11 happened. And it was just this um, just horrible tragedy. And we were all in shock. And there, But there was so much camaraderie and you know, not, not, yeah and, I, it's not, and it doesn't have to come off as like some absurd nationalist you know attitude i just think it was just there was a unit it, was, it brought us together it was a it was a very sympathetic unity as a as a people of a nation that had been you yeah. know attacked and and it was a it was gonna be a beautiful thing in that aspect and 15 minutes later or you get the next generation that and now all of a sudden everyone's get conspiracy this theory that conspiracy theory that you know that it, if you weren't there at the time you know and it's just like and is everything nothing's black and white nothing's simple i'm not discounting the, but i my point is is i remember um i'd seen a bunch of conspiracy theory stuff and i was just getting really uh, tired of it and i was like jesus christ like what you know the bloody blah i had some post about you know, the, or our own government attack. And someone said, not our own government, not this, not that, just a few thugs, you know? And I was like, well, that's a really good way to put it, you know, because right. it is, it's always just a handful of, you know, when you get a handful of the wrong people with power that they, they're going to, they can, they can just trash everything real, real fast, you know? So, yeah. um, who knows, yeah, man? Absolutely. I think, I think the, the biggest problem I think we all have or, or that we see all the time is that, we, 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 there's these huge labels in terms of like, you're on this side or you're on that side or you're for this or you're, and you forget about all the ins and outs and interest intricacies uh, within each of these things. Like there's good and bad within it all. And so the whole point in my mind is that we should be looking at people as individuals and individual communities. And that's where you start, you know, making a difference in healing, you know, by, by spreading some large blanket over an entire, you know, uh, any, any one thing I think is that's like saying like all country music sucks or all metal right. stupid or satanic. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. You know, not all people are the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's very nuanced. I mean, you have, um, a, uh, let's see. I was trying to think of, about this a little bit earlier today where, you know, you have absolutes that people are demanding, right? You, you have to think like we think, yeah. and then you have the labels when it should be something in, and and you know, one of the things that I've always, uh, been taught and have experienced is that, you know, it's, you meet somebody, it doesn't really matter, you know, what color they are. I, I could care less, right? It, it's, it's the character, mm-hmm. right? how you, how you hold yourself, how you act, right? Do you do the right thing when nobody's looking that type of stuff? That's, that's really what we should be looking at. Not if you're, you know, um, you know, how many, (laughs) what are you descended from? You know, like how many different, (laughs) how many different, uh, yeah, it's almost things can you identify as right? Almost like it's it's almost like the office space. Like, are you wearing your flair today? You know what I mean? Like, Oh, how dare you not wear, was it you or someone that brought up the Seinfeld episode where Kramer doesn't wear the pink rhythm ribbon for the AIDS March, even though he's doing (laughs) it, I think that was persecuted uh, for it. I thought it was like such a great example. It's like, no, I share that on, uh, whatever someone's doing, like what's, someone's actually doing like where if you're actually allocating money to 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 help and you know with programs and you're going and you're in the inner city schools helping or you're a teacher or you're that's far more important than you you know like i like you said putting a black box on your facebook page or whatever and that's fine we can do that i have no problem with people expressing that but i think like like let's what are we i think the big thing is just like what are we really doing like where's the money really going and what's really going to be be solved you know and i and i i don't know the whole defund the police is just this broad phrase. What does that mean? You know? 
Yeah. So, you know, for some people, it means to uh, reallocate certain line items within the police budget to uh, supplement other programs, which, you know, I can get on. I don't necessarily think anything should come out of the police budget personally because I mean, clearly like reform is something we would I, I can all agree on i think and extend yeah. training and re uh, you know yeah so I, I think practices you know and all for yeah. and such but yeah so i i've heard the argument i've heard these points with the argument right so people say hey we've already tried reform and i'm like really when i mean when did we do that what i mean what was done right because i don't remember anything it's so ironic because that. you know f- less than 30 years ago remember it wasn't during the clinton administration when they had this huge thing where they put a hundred thousand more cops out blah 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 right it was like a big yeah you know the complete opposite well, of what's happening now yeah well with when clinton was in office i think the uh and he's he's come back and apologized for it but i think his his whole stance was being tougher and it, it resulted in incarceration of a lot more people that shouldn't be you know for for, for uh, little stuff right bullshit but, fucking dr- war on drugs man yeah yeah um, yeah, so that, that's one argument, right? That people say, oh, we've tried reform before. I'm like, uh, oh, yeah, not in the last, you know, since Clinton was in office. Right. Or they'll say something along the lines like, uh, you know, there, sh- there shouldn't be SWAT teams or, you know, this, the 911 operators need to be under some other department. It needs to be moved. Um, I mean, here's the thing that people don't get is that, and, and we saw this in Seattle, right? Cause they, in Portland, you see police being limited by the city government, right? So a lot of the policies that come in place come from from city government, right? Or the county government, whoever you're looking at, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more than just reforming police. You have to look at the district attorney. You have to look at city council. You have to look at the policies that they, that they uh, you know, set up within the city. You have, you have uh, city councilmen in Los Angeles that are saying defund the police, but then again, they're, you know, they're making, you know, they have private security or they're having police provide security for their houses, things like that. Yeah, right. So it's Hollywood just, behind your golden gate, you know, tell everyone else yeah, how to live their life. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you have, you have this going on you. And for some people, it means abolish the police entirely and set up something like they did in Seattle with the Chaz or chop or where the, yeah, I don't know, man, that's uh, where, where they had know. a secret or uh, they had not a secret. They had a uh, private security that basically hindered things that acted worse than the police do, you know, in some respects well, that's where they interesting, right? Because you're talking about doing that. Like, well, who's going to, who's, where's the check, where are the checks and balances there? Right. Yeah. Who's, yeah. who's going to, who's going to hold those people accountable? Yeah. Where's the and training? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, ultimately what needs to happen is that there needs to be more training, better training for police officers, right? There needs to be de-escalation training, not just go to your gun. You think about it, police academy lasts for, you know, just depending on the, on the state and city and whatnot, it's going to last, you know, for a few months or, or whatnot. They're going to have some training, you know, they're, they're going to be put out in the streets and, and, and neither, you know, they have to take supplemental training if, if that, right. If, if the department has money for it or the budget for it or uh, do it on their own. So there, there needs to be better training, I think, on how to handle situations and de-escalate and, situations. and stringent consequences for when they, that's another huge problem is when these guys yeah. have been getting away with this shit, you know, I mean, yeah. this, this, the, the whole George Floyd thing never should happen because that guy should have been off the force fucking years ago. Yeah. And I think the problem there is, uh, in some cities, there's some unions set up, right. That, uh, that, that hinder the police department, right. So these police unions have a little bit more power where they can dictate what can happen to a police officer in that, in that respect. Right. So, um, so there's that. And, and, uh, so there, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. I don't, me personally, I don't feel that defunding is the answer. I mean, it's gotten so ridiculous. Like people were complaining about uh, a kid show, right? Paw Patrol. Like it's like puppies. Oh, that kind of stuff is absurd, man. I mean, yeah. dude, oh, it's moronic. We, we yeah. have we, people are, you know, oh, well, we can't have Elmer Fudd. We can't have Paw Patrol. We can't have this. We can't. Meanwhile, there's like 4,000 serial killer documentaries and mob documentaries and murder this and murder that and violence and vi- violence and violence and violence. I'm sorry, dude. And I'm like, I'm all for free speech and doing and saying all that, but like you just watch any Quentin Tarantino movie. Like what? Uh, it, really? Elmer Fudd's the problem. Yeah. Like, give me a fucking yeah. break, man. You know? 
Yeah, and it's uh, I I know the language they're using. It's very, um, you know, it's very uh, typical of uh, you know some of the uh, earlier stuff put out by you know Karl Marx, things like that. So it, it's just really crazy stuff. And you know, you have defund the police, then it moves to defund the military, then it's like abolish the police. So there's all these calls for you know do something with the police, which you know honestly. Uh, I heard I heard a, a retired Navy SEAL say this the other day, and he's like, you got to make your world small, right? You can't solve all the problems, all the world, be offended with everything. I mean, if you're offended by something, it's more than likely it's your problem. It's not anybody else's right. problem. No, it's the truth, right? man. But uh, well, yeah, you got to keep you got to keep your world small. You got to make sure that your local community is is, uh, you know, be active in your local community and not, yeah, you know, absolutely. because you hate, and I think a lot of this too is because they just hate Trump and yeah, he's a, <laughs> he's a piece of work. Right. But at the same time, you know, you've got people that refuse, um, to take, uh, what's the drug that he, that he hyped up hydroxychloroquine. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, he was hyping that. And so people just hate him so much that if they get hit with the COVID bug, then they just refuse to take it. Even though, People in other countries, other doctors, you know, outside of the White House, outside of the administration, just in medicine in general, just rave about it. And they've talked about how they helped, you know, patients recover just with this really cheap and expensive drug in a Z-Pack. Yeah, so. I think the, the biggest disservice with, um, I mean, the whole, you know, just things get so out of control and so, so spun that you don't know anything that's even yeah. remotely true anymore. But with Trump, I mean his own actions. It's so disappointing because if someone like that as the leader of the free world, the president of the United States of America, for God's sake, man, just quit fucking tweeting from the toilet and grow up. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's for guys like us to do, not the president of the United States. You know what I mean? And so yeah. it's like, if he would just carry himself more president, like, of course, there are going to be people that hate that guy, no matter what, just like people hated Obama. There are some people that are yeah. blind, po you know, identity politics all the way. And they just, that's just the way they're always going to be. And it's really unfortunate. Yeah. But I think, you know, Trump has made it. And, and for me personally, like it, it, that, that is a, the, the GOP, like I'll, that's a huge broad term, but the, the, the Trumpers, you know, in my mind, they, they just, they're just fueling the fire. Now the, the far leftist, the Marxist, if you want to call them that, or they're going to fucking hate him anyway, regardless, yeah. I get it. But I think it's really, I don't feel like he's doing himself or the Republican party and, and anyone else who's sort of like is on that gravy train any, any favors by coming off that. And so Brad, and I don't know, that's just my own opinion. And that's, what's always yeah. really turned me off to Trump from the very, from the get go, you know? Yeah. He, he's not doing them any favors. Neither is like some of the, the democratic politicians are not doing any favors for their, for their party. I, I, I don't align with any one party. If I did, it'd probably be the veterans party because they stand for more of a constitutional take of everything, right. Mm -hmm. uh, abiding by the constitution, like, you know, like we're supposed to, but, um, yeah, it's just so crazy. And, and the media doesn't help, you know, they're just so biased. You look at Fox, you look at CNN, and it's just there every, I heard Denzel Washington, a quote from him when somebody, a reporter asked him about politics or something. And he's like, well, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you watch the news, you're misinformed. He goes, it doesn't matter. He goes, nowadays, it doesn't matter if you get it right. It's just who's first. Right. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's basically great. what the news cycle is. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. So he doesn't play that anyway, either. And and I think when people ask him, who did you vote for? He goes, it's none of your business. And I'm like, I like that. Dude, that's the I've, approach I'm taking. I've always liked Denzel, man. Like he's, yeah. uh, he's just a cool fucking dude. He's a stand up dude. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I just hate the fact that people are now, you know, there's like purity tests, litmus tests, you know, who, who do you vote for? Who do you line with? And I'm just going to just start telling people it's none of your business. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, your right to say that. I mean, that's the whole yeah. thing, you know, that's why we go and we do it secretly in the poll and you know, that's, and that's okay. You know? And I think, um, you don't have to, it's not, you know, your vote is what matters. It's not you telling everybody who you voted for and all that, right. you know, and yeah. that's the, the, the real power lies in that vote. And, um, yeah. So are, what are your back to the defunding police on, on your, yeah. um, what have you heard in terms of, uh, what's going on here in Austin? I, I heard there was a pretty big cut, right? 150 million. Yeah. I think I was, uh, uh, do you know the percentage wise? I feel like it was like pretty high. Yeah. Like a it third was of the budget or it something was like a third of the budget. Yeah. 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 So, and it was like reducing budget from specialized teams like the SWAT team and some other teams, which 
uh, ironically, SWAT was created because of the the you know the Charles Whitman you know at the UT Tower shooting <laughs> yeah. back in the day, right? Yeah. So after that happened, that's that's when SWAT became a thing. Um, so that was back in the '60s, and uh, it would almost so yeah. I mean, yeah, and so like canine units, things like that, were which is ironic because if you can flush out somebody and subdue somebody with a canine instead of shooting them why wouldn't you have more canines on the street yeah more trained dogs things like that so it's it's just you know i i think these people are doing it just to save their own ass right they're they're paying protection money so the mob doesn't come after them no of course i I feel like there's so much political pressure right now yeah. On, on everyone uh, that it's got to be and i mean i'm pretty sure it was a very unanimous i mean i you know the city count uh, um um vote on that from what i've from what i've seen yeah there um, may have been one or two outliers but yeah for the most part i think it was i'm just curious be. to see how the um the funds are you know reallocated i wonder i wonder if uh you know there's going to be some re uh, the what what where the the homeless problem that seems to be getting more becoming more of a of a thing. I wonder if something yeah, I heard I'm, is going into into looking into that a bit more. I'm I'm not hopeful because Adler, you know, to address the homeless problem because people were complaining about it. He he flew out to the two places that probably have a worse homeless problem than we do: Los Angeles and San Francisco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he just needed to go up to Seattle make it a trifecta, but that's, that's where he went. I think he should have just gone straight down 35 to San Antonio. Cause I think they've done a way better job with uh, dealing with the homeless down there. I think they've had some programs and some shelter set up, and I, I think they've done a lot better, uh, in, in terms of, you know, how to handle that. But, you know, of course he hired somebody, he, you know, Acevedo was out of California and that guy was not my favorite police chief. Um, now he's in Houston just spouting off all stuff. You know, it's the guns problems. Yeah. It's a gun problem, right? And it's not people problem. Yeah. It's not a people or a character problem. It's, it's guns, right? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, mental, hate to tell them, you know, mental illness problem is what it is. Mental illness. I mean, people are just people. I mean, and I when I, I, mental realize, illness, I mean, we're, I mean, we're all, we're, we're in a society where we're set up to be quote mentally ill, you know? Yeah. Well, I think if people got off Twitter, I would think if we just burned down Twitter, you know, speaking <laughs> of canceling, right? I think if we just got rid of Twitter, I think that would fix a lot of things. Twitter is just a dumpster fire. Um, <laughs> social and media then, cancel culture. There's the answer. There we go. I mean, I, I mean, it's social media is just, it's good, it, but then it at the be same so toxic, man. It, oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, and then I think it just trains people to just, you know, want things to happen quickly, instantaneously, right? Which isn't, isn't realistic, yeah. right? Instant gratification. Uh, nobody wants to work for anything is, is the way I'm taking it. You know, everybody wants, right. Everybody it, wants everything now. Right. right. I, I'm, I, and I'm not going to actually get off my ass and do anything to be proactive either. I'm just going to make a meme about it, you know? Yeah. And tell other people how wrong there are (laughs) and that they're a piece of shit for not agreeing with me. You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. It's like, you're a racist, you're a Nazi, you're this, you're that. And it's just like. (laughs) I, you know, it's funny, the people that are calling other people racist, Nazis, whatever, whatever else they're coming up with, uh, probably have never even cracked open a book to read about real racism, real Nazis. Um, I mean, and and I say that because the stuff that comes out of their mouth is ridiculous. You know, it's insane. Yeah. And, and then some, it, it's crazy because I, I, I've been taking, I've been doing this even before COVID, but I've been just digging more into books, more nonfiction, you know, some historicals, biographies. I read MLK's biography. It was a great book, great insight, right? How he felt about Malcolm X, you know, his life, what he faced. And even just like talking to my, you know, uh, family, you know, what my aunt, aunts and uncles, you know, parents had to go through as uh, as latinos right i mean they had to use the same door that that black people had to use you know the side back door entrance right so they, yeah. they couldn't go into uh to restaurants um so i mean it, it, it's not the 1960s it's not the 1940s it's not the 1920s right where it's not it's not as bad as people are making it out to be uh there's other countries that are way worse yeah right um as far as oppression, I think it's just people are so privileged nowadays. They're mm-hmm. just making up stuff to complain about. Well, what I think know? though too is like this notion that there's there's any sort of like you know maybe not utopian, but but that's almost like what what it's being. Oh yeah, 
that's re- yeah, portrayed as there yeah. are always going to be bad people period of yeah, any color absolutely. what those in a, those that that are poverty stricken and from ghettos those in high positions from mansions there's just bad people unfortunately most people are not like most people are not horrible monsters but they're out there and it's like and you know it's just it doesn't matter yes we always need to look at reform and and, and you know push for equality and all these things but when you think what that's the, what gets frustrating is when you think about the immense amount of progress that has been made in the last century or even 50 years since the civil right mo- movement even like it's amazing and even someone like us you know growing up in like the 80s and 90s it's like Things I think have improved since then, even. But even, but even then, I mean, granted, easier for me to say as a white guy, I'll acknowledge that. But even then, man, it was like we were very integrated. I've always had, you know, mixed friends of all kinds of races, yeah. and uh, you know, and I've ex- I know that different people have experienced different fucked up things. But it's just that's part of that's just life. It shit happens, yeah. you know. Shit happens. And, exactly. I, mean, I know that it's it's got to be harder to be in, you know, in a certain, uh, uh, you know, what's the, like, you know, ec- not even that, like, but just the sort of like, maybe like an economic standpoint of like, you know, an impoverished community. Yeah. Or something. It's like, like a caste system. Almost. You know what I mean? But it's like, but yeah. dude, like there are so many quote unquote, decent, just working middle-class people of all kinds of backgrounds. Yep. And it's like, who the fuck has their back? You know? That's they're yeah. the ones that are always getting fucked by everybody. You know, it's like, well, th- yeah, those are the ones that I think voted for Trump, right? They, they they may have voted for Obama in the last election and they were like, just screw all this stuff. I'm going to vote for, you know, it's a bad guy, but I'm going to vote for Trump. And the irony with Trump is <laughs> I, I, I'm here's what's funny to me is when it came to Trump, I never liked Trump from from day one. Right. But. I laughed when he got vote when he when he got voted in when he got when he oh same here elected because I thought that there was the, the tantrums the elitist the that whole you know for lack of a better word we'll say the, the sort of the Hollywood crowd right that that elitist smug attitude of like how which is what we're seeing now obviously of yeah. how dare you dream to disagree with me on anything and if you do you are a racist and a this and a that you know and not all this ridiculous nonsense and it's like that was the the blowback to that is the whole reason that fucking trump of all people got elected in the first that's what's so goddamn ironic about this whole thing you know it's like you fucking assholes are the whole reason like trump is here in the first place you fucking jack offs and now it's just keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed and I mean, Jesus Christ, man! Like, yeah, what are like? We don't, we don't have options. That's the worst part. We just have no options. Everyone's going, oh, lesser of two evils, I guess. You know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you mentioned smug, and I just thought about that South Park episode where San everybody Francisco. in San Francisco was smelling their own farts, <laughs> and they had the perfect storm of smugness, and it just yeah. tore the city apart. Because uh, I think, I think uh, uh, Stan's dad, Randy, was driving a Prius or something, or yeah, and somebody would pull up, for, you know, next to him, and like, oh, you're driving a Prius, good for you, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I you know I I'd rather help the environment or I can't remember what the the no it's so it's so true man like you know and I think it's um yeah I'm not I'm not you know I live and let live just just don't just don't be a shitty person it's a it's you know and if and here's my big thing I mean if and if someone is a shitty person there needs to be fucking consequences for it you know like I. I am all about being fucking tough on crime, man. And like, I, I hate this notion of just like a slap on the wrist and get a good lawyer and it's all good. Like that's our biggest fucking problem right there, man. Like why are we looking at individual crimes? And then they, everyone gets a, a public defender. Okay. Or, you know, fair enough, but man, a good public look, defender, look at yeah. these, look at these. I mean, so much damage has been done from defense attorneys alone, in my opinion, just, just defense attorneys and DAs. I mean, horrible. Yeah, yeah, the the whole. I mean, it's not like I said. It's not the police. There's multiple layers that you have to deal with, right? It's city ordinances. It's the city council wanting you know private security from the police, but you know, hey, hey you know, just have a middle amount in the ghetto, right? So, right. Uh, but then you have like folks like the DAs. Like, um, I was watching the uh, the documentary about Greg Kelly, the kid up in Leander, played football for Leander High School. Mm-hmm. Right. And so uh, he was accused of of uh, of um, uh, exploiting a child or something like that. Right. So he gets prosecuted. He gets sent to prison. And I think it, it was really harsh 
punishment. I think it was like 30 years or something. Right. Yeah. He, and, and this documentary goes into the documentary took the viewpoint of we're going to document this story. We're not taking any size. We're going to show everything, but you know, come to find out like the DA's office was just, it was, they were so horrible. They just wanted to get a conviction. They didn't allow any type of evidence that would actually, that actually would matter to the case. Right. They just wanted them gone, uh, in, in prison. And, um, uh, and, and this is where the really cool thing was, um, no matter what party you align with, it was a Republican, it was a Republican DA. She lost to another Republican, right? She got beat out. So this guy came up and he's like, this is, this, this is messed up. So they did the retrial and that's how he got free. Anyway, it's a, it's a great documentary. It kind of blew my mind that he went through all that crap. But anyway, uh, yeah, there's just so many layers to this thing, you know, the, the city ordinances, city council, um, you know, whatever else, you know, uh, hey, you can't mess with this guy because he's really rich and he donates to the to the city, right? So you can't really do anything to him. Yeah, no, it's just all, the politics of it all, man, is what yeah. fucking... It's just it's this massive corrupt mess. And then it's like the notion that, like, it's... Yes, there's bad cops. Uh, of course, there yeah. are. It sucks. It's, un, it's There's always going to be... But it's like to sit there and right? just point the finger at one... Like you said, at one particular aspect when there's this huge layered system, this broken system that is contributing to all of this, whether it's minorities, incarceration, you know, un, unfairly, yeah. I can only imagine how many people have been locked up for years over some bullshit fucking drug charge. Meanwhile, yeah. you have people that have the money and the lawyers that are running around as child molesters, pedophiles, rapists, murderers, the whole lot. And they're just roaming the fucking streets. It's insane. 100%. And I, I don't give a shit what it color any of those people are. Like, if you get busted for pot, like, dude, whatever, man. If you fucking rape somebody, fuck you. You know, like, you yeah. need to be incarcerated. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's, and just that in a nutshell is why I think the, the whole defund the police narrative is pretty moronic because it's not going to, it's, if it most, it's going to make things worse, I think. Right. Cause well, it's we'll just, see because it's happening. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, well, yeah. It's, it's happening. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 yeah, I know it's, it's just, I think it's just <laughs> the, it's the, it's the classic painting everything with a broad, you know, stroke kind of thing. It's just, it's just never, I don't think it had that ever really solves problems. Cause like you said, I mean, at the end of the day, things happen on, at, on a local level, you know, and it starts with individuals and communities and, and um, I don't know. I think also, again, like we said earlier, I think Lots and lots of people have good intentions, you know, and I don't claim to be any smarter than anyone else or anything like that. But I'm just like, I think it's we should just always be cautious and really, Vigilant. you know, investigate yeah. what, you know, when when big things or changes are taking place. Yeah, it's a very reactive. Uh, yeah, reactive is a good right word. Now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's not it, we're not we're not digging into what the real problems are. We're just we're just throwing band-aids on stuff and it's 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 a dumb way to do things um you, you never you never really fix anything that way it just causes more problems down the road all right circling back to the the, <laughs> the 2016 election after he won uh, i my favorite thing from that time has been uh during the inauguration and there was that girl or uh, maybe it was a guy i have no idea but she was like down on her knees and she was just like yeah you know screaming and somebody put like some just death metal you know thrash. oh yeah <laughs> <Slayer>! <laughs> oh dude i love those meme those uh the triggered memes are like my favorite those are oh, those whatever are that girl is that's the poster child for that triggered meme is great well and, and it's funny because it, it's it's folks like that and everything offends me i'm offended by everything, everything offends me well and, and not to not to bag on white people because i've had plenty of friends that are that no are please white. go I mean, for I, it i've got yeah. white people I mean, I've got deserve mixed, it i've got a mixed family you know so uh so i mean i, I try not to bash uh based on identity right which is i think i think what people want anyway I don't yeah know. no it's, it's, it's so weird it's just not but it but it, it, I, it's funny. It's like it's it's ironic. It's sadly funny that the people that are screaming loudest about all this stuff are are these these woke white people, right? Woke. And they're 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 sitting there in front of cops, and they're they're probably you know I I saw some white chick 
screaming at these black cops, calling them racist or something, or, you know, uh, uh, disgrace to their race and all this other stuff. I'm like, what the hell, man? I'm like, it's It'd be it's the first, w- the first girl that said that, that called, uh, called the cops from her Westlake neighborhood. <laughs> There's a black <laughs> That's man right. walking down my street. Yeah. And I'm oh, afraid yeah, to yeah. go outside and pout my lips and post on Instagram. Can you come please pick him up, please? <laughs> I wanted to it's, do a Black it, Lives Matter post, but there's a black man outside. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. It's it's the white savior complex, man. Right? They they think to think so little of people standing up for themselves that they have to stand up for you, right? So it's patronizing. It's it, very it, patronizing. It is. That's to what's weird to me is I feel like it's kind of like I I feel like it's got to feel that way to. Um, you know, some people where it's just, it's almost, it feels almost more insulting, you know, it's like, hello, yeah. like I'm a fucking adult in a, you know, a free society. I thought that can, can stand up for myself and make my own way. Thank you very much. I don't need, you know, reparations from my white neighbor, you know? Yeah. But I, I, and again, I, though, like, I don't think that most people think like that either, you know, no, and, and even, they, and even a lot of people like doing well on the black lives matter movement. And like, again, like I, there's a lot of like, I'm all for like, the, the protesting of course let's, pro- let's protest against police brutality let's have police reform like i have no problem with any of that you know but but now if you're out there like you know posting on your instagram about how you want to abolish the police uh well <laughs> do you really is that really what you want you know yeah yeah meanwhile there you know i think it was up in minneapolis there was a there was an there was an older black lady you know in her senior years that was that was crying because you know, the rioters burned down the only grocery store within within her vicinity. Right. So she the buses weren't running. Cabs weren't running. See, she didn't have any way to get any groceries or supplies or anything. And yeah. she was she was just like, you know, black lives really matter to you guys. Well, like Seriously, it's like kind of yeah, like the just, L.A. riots, you know, that time. It's just like when your own oh community is getting fucking destroyed. Like who's losing this battle here? You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it's. I remember that well. Marines went in there to help uh, secure that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! Yeah, that was yeah, pretty crazy. Um, at least the, at least we had like I felt like we at least we had like good music back then though. Now here we go, old old stuff again, old guy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. B- back then we had some d- some decent tunes that we could crank. Where are the what are the amp- I'm sure there's some like anthems of the day from like. Uh, imagine dragons has written something who knows i don't know like whatever it is i don't know what it is but someone's got some touching black lives matter whatever it is it'll win a fucking grammy i guarantee you that much <laughs> and the woke award goes to oh man the woke award that's brilliant i uh that's a, that's that's almost like a glazer oh man the, the, <laughs> the woke award oh i like it that's good dude okay uh, i feel like we've yeah. we've found our uh well we, we will we'll, we'll have to do okay so real quick i guess we've already been going for two hours but um the um we should describe so <laughs> we've talked about ourselves a little bit obviously um let's let's let, let's sum up with a little bit of a quick uh synopsis about ourselves and then we'll talk about a, yeah. a couple of specifics about the podcast moving forward if you want to go first yeah. Yeah, so Vic, um, you know, I've, I've uh, known Skunk for quite a while. I uh, have a background in uh, not music at all. Is <laughs> I mean, I actually work in the private sector, but uh, you know, I've always always grown up around music. Um, you know, my dad was uh, one of the guys that uh, came back from Vietnam, and so I grew up on a lot of old Vietnam era rock and roll when everybody else in my family was listening to to Hano and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so just, uh, moved to Austin back in 2000, hooked up with skunk and just been going at it ever since. But, uh, yeah, that's me. I, uh, yeah. So we met, I think in 2005 and, uh, yeah. but, you know, when you said a private sector that made me think of ghostbusters, there's a line, <laughs> there's a line in that movie where he goes, you've never worked in the private sector. They expect results. <laughs> <laughs> you've never been out of college. I've worked in the private sector. They respect, they expect in. results. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, man. Um, and I was here just shortly before we met, uh, in 2005, I came, I came here in 2004, and uh yeah just been doing music almost that whole time like joined that band yeah. quarter shackle in 2006 and started teaching and so i've been teaching for the last almost 15 years 
and playing in just a variety of bands and recordings, primarily a good rogering, um, rune scarred, just sort of progressive thrash. How would you describe these bands, Victor? If I, I'm going to ask someone else instead of me, how would you describe a good rogering? I mean, I know what I started describing it as, but good rogering. I, I'd say it's a, an, a very eclectic rock metal mixture of just awesome goodness. Oh, I like that. Uh, awesome goodness. <laughs> Eclectic awesome goodness. That's that. Okay, there you cool. Go. I've got a new description for that one. Um <laughs> and uh, RuneScard. Yeah, RuneScard, I think you were you were right on with the progressive progressive, yeah. Kind of kind of old, there's kind of like an old school thrash about it, but also it's yeah. like we've got we have some pretty pro- like progressive Tim Driscoll the the sort of the head kind of riff writer guy like A, he's just crazy prolific. And I'm always trying to get him to slow down a little bit. I need to start like, I need to get Tim hooked on like some quaaludes and shit. So, right, like slower riffs. Although I love it when it's like, he's like, oh, hey, I came up with something like an Alice. And I'm like, yes, Alice in Chains. Like, I can play it without my arm falling off. But yeah, man, like he's got some like really, really, um, it's it's pretty incredible music. Like I, I equate it to like Rust in Peace. Like that's how intricate the com- yeah. the compositions are. Like they're really, they're really something. So that's yeah. a, that's a pretty pretty cool thing be bully los buffaloes what would you what would you sum that up as i i mean it, it kind of reminds me of um more of a kind of modern latin type of rock um yeah like rock and roll with a kind of a latin twist i say yeah, based on yeah. him and like some sometimes he sings in spanish and stuff like that right so. yeah it's where my spanish class comes in handy now i know that's I know right three you words can, i can sing into the microphone Shout out I, I, I sing backup vocals on shit and I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there's uh, and then there's the Invincible Czars who um, toured last year um, doing would do silent uh, silent movie scores like original silent movie uh, scores for silent films. And they've been those guys have been around for a long time. I think that band got started in 2003 or something like that. It's been quite a while. Um I think we're like neck and neck in terms of who ha- has had more roster changes between the czars and, and a good rogering. So, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you so. definitely have much more flavor in your background than I do. Um, I mean, all I've ever done was go to high school, try college, figure out it wasn't for me, went in yep. the military for a little while, got out, came here. <laughs> so. I did both. I did all, I pretty much did the same thing. I went to high school. I sucked at it. Um, I was, I was like a Jekyll and Hyde in terms of like, I was always, I've always been nocturnal. So I'd always be tired. And I was like king of tardies dead to the world for the first half of the school day. And then after like lunch, I was like a maniac and like my, like my manic depression was just uh, prevalent all through then. Like, you know, it's like two different people almost. And so there was that. And I tried the whole college thing a little bit and then, you know, bounced around and landed obviously just doing music, which has been a, Whenever I kind of, I was kind of late in the game getting into music, you know, like I grew up with like a handful, my parents had a handful of like great classic rock albums and a couple of soundtracks and stuff. So, I mean, I always like got that, like the be a little bit of Beatles, Sergeant Pepper, Fleetwood Mac rumors, the doors, greatest hits, like I, Elton John's great. I can remember the, the like 10 cassette tapes that w- as a kid were very influential, but I didn't really, for me, the, the huge catalyst was hearing appetite for destruction and just being like sold on that quote unquote heavy metal you know because i was like oh yeah literally the kid that was like oh i you know everything in the 80s was satanic all these things it's comical <laughs> now but iron maiden yeah. and judas were satanic and Ozzy oh, yeah. satanic. everyone's yeah. satanic satan satan all these dumb twats like fucking you know tipper gore that want to fucking regulate everybody and uh, right. so it's like all that whole ridiculous nonsense going on so th- it was really funny how you know that was so I didn't really grow up with the eighties MTV or any of that. And it was the early nineties when I got into the guns and roses and the Metallica and some of the eighties, I kind of had a cross of those bands, the hair metal stuff. And then all the cool shit that we talked about that was going on in the early nineties. And it just like, that was an explosion for me. And that's like, ever since then, I've just been on that path. You know, I, I remember when appetite came out because they would play it on the radio and this was before I got regular airplane blew up. It was like a summer of, uh, what was it? 86, I think is when it came out. 87. 87. Yeah. yeah. So it was in the summer. I remember cause I had a job working with my uncle and he was a, like a custodian at the school. And so I got a job at the school, went to go work with my uncle, 
had a great time. Got to spend time with my uncle. Awesome dude. You know, never. I didn't. Lots, of, know, gl- he lots was just, of gladiator movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gladiator movies. That's right. I always think of airplane. Yeah, it, yeah. If I had to think of, you know, circling back to like, uh, you know, current events, it's like South Park. And it's like that scene in, in, uh, in an airplane where everybody starts panicking on the airplane and you just see shit flying around. Exactly. And people, yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, I, I so I remember listening to that album quite a bit, and then once school started, and it got a lot more airplay, and, and other kids discovered it, and everybody was like, "Oh man, this is a brand new group," and blah blah. blah. I'm like, "Bro, I mean, you're you're like four months late into the game. I already heard this album." <laughs> I know, dude. I was so I was so late into it, man. But once I got the bug out, I I remember like so specifically, like it's very vivid. Like I can remember walking to my brother's room where his friend had come over with a cassette tape and then i ended up dubbing the cassette tape right and it was oh, uh yeah. the, old dub, the old dub days yeah i've always been <laughs> you a had to tape I, I you had to tape the holes roll. yeah i was a rock and roll <laughs> rebel and and I, I literally walked in and i was like is this that heavy metal stuff like because it just sounded like you know noise i was listening to like a little bit i just started kind of getting into some of the rap of the day and like you know so everything my collection was everything from easy e which is awesome to d nice oh, yeah. or young mc or mc hammer or whatever the fuck you know and so that was the first like quote rock and roll heavy metal i'd heard and then i like you walked in with your parachute pants yeah your, uh... <laughs> dude dude you can that is that will will be confirmed i had two short written on my book cover in my air jordan sweatpants we got to get dave to tell you this story that when he calls in man like um the, did you have the hammer lines in the side of your head too i didn't do the hammer lines no i was, okay. I was too white for that my they didn't work with my my blonde hair, uh, my <laughs> puffy blonde hair. Anyway, so I, um, yeah, man. And then, and then I just got like obsessed with that tape. And I just remember riding around my bike, my Walkman, just listening to it over and over and over and over. And I like, not even maybe a year later, I started playing guitar, you know? So that was just, there's probably going to, there's probably going to be people that'll listen to this, like, uh, you know, tens of 10, but that'll be like, what's a Walkman? Or I don't know. Is that our, I think our audience is going to know because I don't think anyone who's like 15 years old or two, even 20 years old for that matter is going to be like, I really want to hear what these dudes have to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe, they probably maybe. will get the reference about taping up the back of the cassette. So you oh, can totally, man. It. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Anyone, anyone pre gen, what is it? Gen Z now? Millenn- and I guess millennials don't. Yeah, anyone pre 2000s probably knows that shit, you know? It's so crazy to think now. I can't fucking believe it, man. Like people that I taught when they were like little kids or in college or or in their mid twenties or even thirty years old now, probably. And like, um, jeez. But people that were born post post nine eleven, you know. Yeah. And I'm going yeah. like, wow, that is nuts, man. You know. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be interesting crazy. to see um, to see uh, who our audience is. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, it, with the podcast, I think. Ultimately, I think what we're trying to do is just, you know, find common ground with people, whether it's through music, it could be through other mediums like books. I'm a real, I love history, studying history. I mean, all the books I've read over the last couple of years have been just about history yeah. for the most part, like these epic battles in Korea or, you know, the the Battle of Thermopylae with the, with the Spartans against the Persians, which... Funny enough, somebody came out with an article uh, either yesterday or today <laughs> talking about how the movie 300. I was just going to make uh, a was, joke about that. Uh, that whole battle yeah. was in slow motion, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. But they were talking about how it's so racist and misogynistic and homophobic. And I'm like, what is this chick talking about? And so the, movie the, the art, is or what? Yeah, yeah. She she talks about the movie and I guess uh, and it's based off of Frank Miller's um comic book or graphic novel right but she she hammered on both of them about you know the spartans were the white guys and they were good guys and persians were you know ethnic oh, yeah. you know with different you know uh color yeah and basically i'm like uh, you gotta read into it as far as you can to to, to fit your uh you know whatever you're to fit your narr- yeah you fit your narr- i think yeah. it's the big problem is people read into things too much right yeah. they 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 just kind of just no i mean it's yeah stuff. it's 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 uh it's I'm exhausted. It's, I don't even have yeah. words. Well, here's the thing: like with, with the podcast, what what what's cool to me oh, yeah, I think, about yeah. this is is just for me personally, at least, is like just through all the like various people I've met over the years. You know, like many, many, many of them are musicians, obviously, but just all kinds of different people. And so I think just the idea of like 
you know, and a few people just since this whole pandemic has started, people I barely know or maybe not even knew at the beginning of it. Like these are people that have found me or I found, you know, who in some weird way have connected and talked and chatted and, and a few of them even like on the actual phone or whatever. But you get to know people as people, as individuals, yes. you know, like not right. like we've been talking about where you're just you're at meme warfare with each other. And it's just I'm one thing and you're another thing. And that's ridiculous, you know, so I think like the idea of having like a you know, different guest weekly, if that's what we end up doing, like, and just getting to know that person and talk to that person, are we going to agree on everything? Probably not. But I think the idea of just talking to other people, getting their perspectives that helps you to learn and understand other people. I want to talk to all kinds of, I don't want to just serve my own agenda and quote narrative or whatever. I want to like talk to all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds. And for me, I think, and a lot of these people are already my friends, you know, and, or your friends. And it's just like, uh, that is what I think is going to be so cool about this podcast and also fitting in the name in terms of the eclectic soundtracks and like um, just we all are different and come from different places. And, and and that's great. That's what makes a country like America, the United States, great. Right. Ideally. Right. right? Nothing's ever perfect. But we, we you know, I'm trying to say here and it's like. But we, we, there is common ground always to be found in music is, I think, if not, you know, that is certainly, you know, about as good as it gets in terms of like a, un, a universal sort of unifying kind of quality, you know? So I think it's a, it's kind of a nice place to start and just getting to know somebody, like you said, you know, yeah. like us meeting and so many people, like that's one of the first things you often talk about, you know? Yeah. Music, what music you into books, things like that. And then you end up. I, I've made a lot of friends that way and, you know, definitely don't agree on every single little thing, but, and that's fine. Right. And that's, I think that's, what's missing because the way things are now, it's like, if you don't, you know, if you don't think the way I think, then you're a racist, you're a racist. Yeah. <laughs> you're a Nazi. If you're, a, if you're patriotic, you're a racist. We need to come uh, yeah, up, I want to come up with some other words. We need to come up with some other words to start calling people. Cause it's like, you're either like, if you're on that, if you're on that side, it's like, well, everyone's a racist or everyone's a Nazi. And if you're on the other side, it's everyone's a communist and everyone's a this, you know? So it's like, yeah. we need to come up with some other, like, um, I do like the, and, and oh, but back to what we were talking about, we're going to have something called the Glazer award, which, <laughs> which we will, we'll, we'll dive into that, I guess next time. And then, yeah. but I really yeah. like the idea of the, the woke award. That's really good. I think it's a good one. Yeah. yeah. So I, I nominally, to, nominate uh, uh, Alyssa Milano. Well, Melissa Milano from the, her. Remember a uh, little Mel Alyssa Milano in Commando? <laughs> one of the That's greatest right. movies of all oh time. Oh, my God. Yes. Remember when I said I'd kill you last? Bennett. Let off some steam. <laughs> Isn't that the one where he was in an airplane and he, he killed the dude next to him and then he just kind of. Yeah, his hat, like, you know, over his face, and he he's, he's dead tired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah dude, it just wake, yeah, don't wake my friend. He's dead tired. He's dead tired. <laughs> and then like, yeah, he and then like somehow magically, he just escaped through the the bathroom of the plane. Somehow leads he, to the he like, went. He went. Yeah, it, it led to the landing gear or something. Yeah, yeah and then he like, like jumps off of the wheel like in the marsh. And, yeah, yeah. And then Radon Chong was his co star, like worst acting of all time. <laughs> Oh man, I've Commando! That's a high. Though. That is a high recommendation right there for anyone who yeah, hasn't seen I that movie. Love that movie. Uh, nothing else love, we can uh, turn younger. Man. Oh, dude! Uh, yeah, I've talked. It's so funny how these like these these movies are like they always come up. Like just the other day, someone had sent me. I think it was my brother. Like a quote. A quote. And he's like, "What movie is this from?" And I couldn't think of it. And I was like, "I know. I know it's something with like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, or one of the Bruce Willis. One of those three guys, you know." And it was from Running Man. Oh, and then on the other night, yeah. a racer was on. Oh, dude. If you have not watched <laughs> the racer, go watch it. If you have, watch it again. It is amazing. The war. Oh, it's just the, the overly ambitious 1996 CGI is, is one of the many reasons that you must immediately watch that movie. <laughs> well, and then, and then we were talking about Ted two the other day with, uh, what were we, we were talking about something in like a Google search. And then it reminded me of that scene where, where Mark Wahlberg is like, uh, or no, I think Ted was saying that uh, his wife, Tammy Lynn was trying to sign up for Obamacare, but he came back like 10 minutes later and she was looking at black. Cox. Yeah. Like no matter what you Google, you're one, you're like <laughs> you're one, one step away, one step away from, from black Cox. 
And they kept that whole gag going throughout the whole movie. It's no, because like, he was hey, like, remember, to- like he was like, we need to get a lawyer, and he's like, look, black, look at that black cock. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Or, or uh, their lawyer would look up something, and then Google has like, did you mean black cocks? <laughs> oh, dude, and fucking Morgan Freeman, man, is so good in that movie. Like at the very end, he's like, wow, you didn't want to help us, so you can go fuck yourself. And Morgan Freeman and Morgan Freeman voice is like, I will go fuck myself. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I'm going to help you. Dude, Ted 2, uh, is, uh, that's a great movie, man. That, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with you there. I, I liked it better than the first one. Yeah, and first one's damn good. But like the, I was yeah. like, it's pretty rare, I feel like, that a sequel tops the first one, you know? But I think Ted 2 definitely is the, my favorite of the two. I, I think my favorite scene in the first one was at the house party with uh, Flash Gordon, the guy that played Flash Gordon. Uh, it was pretty epic, man. And actually, what's, and, yeah, Flash Gordon was great. Sam Jones, that was his the name, whole, right? Like, and the so cocaine fight, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That guy, the 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 what the dude from the Chinese delivery comes in and he's like Ming, and then they just start that brawl or something. It's pretty great. <laughs> oh, it's you know awesome. what else was great about the first one it was uh, the dude was his name Joel McHale, the guy that's like the total douchebag that boss yes. of Mia. Co- what's uh, her name? Mia Kunis. Kunis. Yeah. And he's all like uh, that. He's like that's Lance Armstrong's nuts <laughs> or nut. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. It's like oh, there was so many like great little things that remember when he's like walking through his house and he's like showing him all this fucking shit and he's just bragging about it all. And this, and then Mark Wahlberg is like, I, I really hope he's like, you know, whatever, whatever. But I, I really got to say, I just, I hope you die from ass cancer or some crazy shit like that. <laughs> That's right, man. I, I don't, I don't think they would be able to make that movie now with people that complain. People say that uh, a lot, but I feel like. There's probably got to be some you know renegades. I, I think, I, you Seth know, that, would, that's a, well, that's the thing is yeah. like, because of the, like guys like him, that's, what's so interesting is like, even amongst all of this stuff, you have the, the South part and God bless them, man. I love, I, lo- I love like I comedian. I have the highest praise for, for comedians and, you know, the, especially the edgy quote comedian. you know, all the guys, yeah. whether it be from Dave Chappelle to, to Bill Hicks, to Richard Pryor, all that kind of stuff too. Like, right. Uh, Ricky Gervais. Ricky uh, Gervais. Uh, that was like one of the Golden greatest Globes, roasts right? of all fucking time. That was so oh, goddamn he, amazing, dude. Yes. It was so good. Just calling everybody out on just God bless those how guys. sanctimonious I love they it. are. Yeah. I love it, man. And, and the same goes for Trey Parker and the South Park gang and and, uh, yeah. and Seth MacFarlane and all the crazy fucking shit he comes up with, man. Yeah. No, like, <laughs> thank God for those people, man. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're talking about the Glazer. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Glazer Award. All right. So, yeah. give a quick synopsis on this, I guess, and then we should probably wrap it up, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I, so I we were <laughs> we kind of alluded to it earlier with uh, the gig that you and your brother did, right? Playing for uh, playing for the boss. He was the steak. You guys were the salt and pepper. And uh, yeah, it just kind of it, it's just funny just being around him and. Uh, you know, he's he's just one of those dudes that uh, has to be cool. Um, <laughs> tries really hard. Nice way to tries say. really tries hard. really hard. Yes, yes. Yeah. And here's the thing: like the the thing about like, granted, okay, the guy gave me a job and all this and that, and then, but it's just it was all of the it, he had all the green the, the red Mustang, you know the oh, check out her. You see that ass? I fucked it. You know what I mean? Like it just <laughs> all that kind of stuff. <laughs> All the time, and not to mention, he was like a, a very, very neurotic sort of uh, micromanagey sort of boss. So he, I, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people that worked there were just like, dude. Like I finally got to a point, like kind of, I was kind of like, well, I said, like there from day one, and I was just like, you need to just fucking lighten up, man. Just chill out, take a fucking vacation. We're independent contractors. Everyone is fully capable of coming in here and doing their job. Just relax, you know. But I think very yeah, that whole neurotic. thing about. Yeah. trying to just prove yeah narcissistic and a lot of like little backhand sort of slights you know those little little what passive aggressive <laughs> almost sort of statements sometimes oh, you've got an epiphone i thought it was a, a exactly <laughs> stuff like that oh what is the oh it's an epiphone oh, i thought it was a gibson you're like jesus fucking christ bro that's a student that's paying money to be here like that's so fucking not cool not not everybody can afford uh what is it like what are they now like five grand yeah and then three grand yeah, and then it was like when I was like, yo, you know, like how about a raise kind of thing? And like, uh, I had that red Mustang before I started this business. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? 
anyway there's there's uh, a lot we could get into there and like i mean I almost hate to like just totally totally like bash somebody but i'm sure i'm gonna bash a ton of people i mean i've already called tipper gore a twat for god's sake so i'm, gonna, I'm sure i'm gonna bash all kinds of people on this thing and, and offend people and i don't give a fuck so uh yeah so the glazer award basically is for people that are douchey is that how we should say it i mean yeah try yeah, too I hard think- that just try too hard you know to just have acceptance and be cool because a lot of times if you just just honestly like just be fucking cool like just it's not that be hard yourself. just be be you yeah that's not that's yeah. not that hard just be yourself be yourself be courteous and uh yeah that's pretty much it so we so what we'll do then is we'll have a monthly thing where we have a glazer award for somebody and a woke award someone we have guests on it's something we can talk about and if something's really topical in a month and everyone's you know the same person comes up, we can be like, well, the, the woke award this month goes to, or the Glazer award this month goes to, or both <laughs> go to. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun. But, uh, yeah. Cool. Cool, dude. Well, um, yeah. So we have, um, we don't even know who our next, our guest is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so here's what happened though. We had a first guest booked and then, and then unfortunately some things came up that, uh, right. it looks like we're going to have to postpone the initial, uh, first guest so guess, we've yeah. got we've got a lot of other people um we, that we've, we've got we to. yeah we got a really interesting guy that i know uh owns an art gallery you know grew up on punk rock and is into everything from um you know ha- has a quite a a really cool background and you know it'd be really interesting to to hear him you know talk about how he went from you know skate being a skateboard guy punk rock to you know running an art gallery and then he's also into ufos which i i dig too you know i love digging into that stuff so uh so you know we've got folks like that and i know you've got some folks too um that we're we're yeah, excited yeah. to talk to you got a lot of different a lot of different people already uh expressing interest so um yeah so we will um i'd have i have no idea how this works this will be up and then we'll share it and then we'll be back on friday well it doesn't matter because it's not live and I'll stop talking now. And I guess we're done. <laughs> well, and now you can put fat and you can put fancy in intro, outro shit, uh, and, and fancy do- intro, outro stuff. And, uh, man, hopefully we can, uh, we can get this posted and hopefully people see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the, the world of, uh, trying to get anyone to care about what you're doing. I will say that, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it can be very discouraging at times when you, in the social media world of, you know, feeling like nobody cares about anything, but what's really cool. So is a lot of times though, when I feel like, well, nobody gets, oh, I have two Spotify, you know, nobody cares about me. And it's like, then all of a sudden someone's just like, man, I've been a fan and I do, you know, so you never know. Like, I think the, the people, yeah. people, there are people out there, they'll, that'll take interest and we might not even, and you know, know about. So, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, just, I'm, hoping, I'm really just I'm excited hoping. to talk, talk to a lot of these different people, man, you know, a lot of, yeah, a lot of different folks, uh, a lot of, you know, really excited to talk to people that are smarter than me so, <laughs> and learn something. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, no, I should just not say anything, but unfortunately <laughs> I will. I should That's apologize cool. at the beginning of every show. I will also be talking. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> Here are the other two smart people talking now. I'll shut up. Cool. Well, I guess we will uh, we'll go ahead and sign off for now, post this, and then uh, figure out what we're going to do this again. So yeah, which Clear- won't be won't be too far in the future. Yeah. No. I, yeah. Clearly, we're totally prepared. So cool. Yeah. We'll, uh, awesome. We'll uh, see everybody soon. All right, man. Later. Late. Nah, Tammy Lynn tried to sign up for Obamacare on the internet, but I came back five minutes later, she was looking at black cocks. It seems like every time you go online, you're two clicks away from black cocks. Look, see? I'll Google Grand Canyon. Here, look, it says, did you mean black cocks? But we don't know any lawyers. All our friends make sandwiches. No, we just Google Boston lawyers. Ah. Jesus, look at that black cock.